We continue with part three of State versus Stephen Avery, State's Response, May 27, 2020. Page 87 of the PDF. Number two, the 2007 Preservation Order does not give Avery a license to pursue available claims piecemeal. Regardless, Avery's argument that the circuit court's refusal to vacate its judgment violated the 2007 order is meritless. The 2007 preservation order requires the state to preserve indefinitely, quote, all bloodstains, unquote, and, quote, all swabs or other collected samples of blood that the state believes contains Stephen Avery's DNA and that were found in or on Teresa Halbach's vehicle, unquote and, quote, portions of all items submitted by the state to the FBI laboratory, unquote, for EDTA testing. Paragraph four of the order further states that Avery, quote, may at any time submit the bloodstains, swabs, and items described in paragraphs one through three for independent scientific testing without further order of the court. The 2007 order says nothing about collection or, quote, further forensic testing, unquote, of other evidence, or about relieving Avery of the rules of post-conviction procedure when raising claims related to forensic testing. And the circuit court's October 3 order did not prevent Avery from seeking any further testing to overcome the procedural bar and raise claims related to that testing though, Avery would still have to meet the post-conviction pleading requirements. That includes showing a sufficient reason why he could not have sought this testing and brought any claims related to at the time he filed earlier motions if he wants to raise claims related to subsequent testing. <clears throat> See Wisconsin Statute 97404. In any event, None of the additional items on which Avery relied in his motion to vacate fall within the 2007 order. Avery claims he planned to test for DNA swabs from the RAV4 battery cables to collect and test new swabs from the bar under the driver's hood crutch, interior hood release, license plates, a lug wrench, and to conduct, quote, a complete examination of the interior and exterior of the RAV4 for additional forensic evidence, unquote. None of that is bloodstained evidence collected from the RAV4 or items submitted to the FBI for EDTA testing. An examination of the RAV4, quote, for additional forensic evidence, unquote, is not even a request for scientific testing of anything. Even if Avery were correct that the 2007 order relieved him of showing a sufficient reason why claims related to scientific testing of evidence listed within it could not all be raised in a single motion, which he is not, nothing Avery submitted to the circuit court would have triggered the 2007 order. The 2007 preservation order does not give Avery a license to pursue his claims piecemeal, nor did it require the circuit court to allow him to amend his motion after he re received an adverse ruling. The court appropriately denied Avery's motion to vacate its October 3, 2017 order. Roman numeral three. The circuit court properly exercised its discretion when it denied the claims raised in Avery's motion for reconsideration as procedurally barred. On October 23, 2017, Avery filed a motion for reconsideration of the circuit court's order denying his June 2017 motion. There, he alleged, number one, the circuit court, quote, failed to properly accept the factual allegations in Mr. Avery's motion as true, unquote. Two, the circuit court misconstrued his expert opinions. Three, the circuit court erred when it concluded that ineffective assistance of post-conviction counsel must be pursued 
via, not, via a night petition. Four, the circuit court erred in finding that he did not show a sufficient reason why his claims could not have been raised earlier. Five, he had, quote, new evidence, unquote, of a Brady violation consisting of a, quote, new witness, unquote, Kevin Romlow, who allegedly told Sergeant Colburn that he saw a car similar to the victim's rob outside the Avery property on November 3 and 4, but no police report existed about the conversation. Six, that he had, quote, new evidence, unquote, that trial counsel were ineffective by failing, quote, to investigate and present to the jury, unquote, impeachment evidence related to Bobby Dassey, consisting of Brian Dassey's 2005 statement to police that Bobby saw, said he saw the victim leave the property. Seven, Avery had, quote, new evidence, unquote, purportedly providing a motive for Bobby Dassey to murder Ms. Halbach, consisting of forensic computer examiner Gary Hunt's examining the forensic image of the Dassey computer provided to the defense before trial and finding violent pornography and images of dead bodies. Eight, Avery had, quote, new evidence of a Brady violation, unquote, consisting of Denise Heidel stating that she had a phone conversation with the victim at 1135 on October 31 about an appointment which Heidel told the authorities. Avery filed two supplements to this motion, adding arguments and claims. Avery alleged in his first supplement that, quote, as undersigned counsel's investigation remains ongoing, additional new evidence continues to develop, unquote, to support his claims. He then raised five new ineffective assistance and newly discovered evidence claims related to the contents of the Dassey campaign and provided an affidavit from Brian Dassey as, quote, further, unquote, impeachment evidence related to Bobby's testimony about Halbach leaving the property. In his second su supplement, Avery alleged that the state committed a Brady violation by failing to disclose to the defense a CD containing Detective Mike Feely's investigative report of his forensic investigation performed on the Dassey computer, which he alleged, quote, must contain evidence favorable to Mr. Avery, unquote. Avery also added an additional argument from his police procedure expert that Scott Tulloch was not, not sufficiently investigated and provided an affidavit from Attorney Strang concurring that he was ineffective for failing to hire a blood spatter or ballistics expert. A. Legal standards and standard of review for motions for reconsideration. Quote, to prevail on a motion for reconsideration, the movement must present either newly discovered evidence or establish a manifest error of law or unquote. Midland Funding, LLC v. Mizinski. Again, to qualify as newly discovered evidence, to qualify as newly discovered, the evidence must meet the five-prong test stated in a it, quote, does not include the new appreciation of the importance of evidence previously known but not used, unquote. Foss now. Evidence previously known includes evidence that was, quote, knowable, unquote, by counsel. This court, quote, reviews a circuit court's denial of a motion for reconsideration to determine if the court properly exercised its discretion, unquote. State v. White. B. The circuit court appropriately exercised its discretion to deny Avery's motion for reconsideration. The circuit court properly found that the claims raised in Avery's motion for reconsideration were procedurally barred. The circuit court applied the correct law to the facts and gave a rational explanation for den denying Avery's motion for reconsideration. 
Accordingly, it properly exercised its discretion in doing so. Jeske. The circuit court observed that in Avery's, quote, numerous filings after October 6th, he submitted a substantial amount of what he calls newly discovered evidence. That characterization is incorrect, unquote. Instead, Avery's motion for reconsideration and subsequent supplements, quote, outlined new arguments and new theories of the case for the court to consider, unquote. But, quote, what was missing in the wealth of arguments and documentation is any explanation as to why the defendant filed his motion on June 7, 2017, knowing that further scientific testing was required to complete his motion and that considerable investigation was still being conducted by the defense, unquote. Escalona Naranjo. Especially bars such claims, quote, unless good cause is shown as to why the issue was not included in the original filing, unquote. The court explained that, quote, there is no reason asserted or good cause shown as to why the motion was submitted, unquote, before all of Avery's investigation was finished. In Avery's post-October 3 filings, he, quote, made it abundantly clear that he knew he had substantial investigation to complete, unquote, but provided, quote, no explanation as to why, without an impending deadline to meet, the defense rushed ahead and filed the motion prior to his investigation being completed, unquote. The court stated that it, quote, finds no basis to reverse its previous decision, unquote and Avery's new arguments and alleged, quote, new evidence, unquote, to back up his old arguments, quote, should have been asserted in the defendant's first motion, pursuant to the holding in Escalona, Naranjo. That was a legally and factually sound evaluation of Avery's post-October 3 motion. Quote, the purpose behind Wisconsin Statute 97406 is to avoid successive for relief by requiring a defendant to raise all grounds for relief in one motion. Aaron Allen, Avery repeatedly claimed everything he alleged was, quote, new evidence, unquote, but it was, quote, new, unquote, only in the sense that Avery did not investigate and develop an argu argument about it before filing his June 2017 motion. And Avery admitted that the only reason, quote, additional new evidence continued to develop, unquote, was because, quote, undersigned counsel's investigation remained ongoing, unquote. As the circuit court correctly observed, that is exactly what Escalona, Naranjo, and Wisconsin Statute 97406 for Successive motions based on new arguments that are only, quote, new, unquote, because the defendant filed a motion without investigating and presenting them. The mere fact that an argument was not raised in a prior motion is not a sufficient reason for raising it in a subsequent one. See State versus Kletzian. And what was uniformly absent from Avery's post-October 3 motions was, quote, any explanation as to why the defendant filed his motion on June 7, 2017, knowing that further scientific testing was required to complete his motion and that considerable investigation was still being conducted by the defense, unquote. Avery still does not attempt to direct this court to any point in the record where he provided any sufficient reason why these claims could not have been raised in a single motion or why he filed his June 2017 motion prematurely. He claims that his motion for reconsider, reconsideration was properly filed, unquote, under Wisconsin Statute 805.173. But that statute applies only to bench trial. Schessler v. Schessler. Regardless, the circuit court did not deny his motion as improperly filed. 
It denied it because it found all of the arguments within it procedurally barred. Avery has provided no real argument that the circuit court's ruling on the procedural bar was legally or factually unsound. Instead, Avery has simply pretended that he submitted these arguments and evidence in his first motion by conglomerating his ineffective assistance of counsel and Brady claims into topical issue sections in his appellate brief, arguing their merits and using these belatedly raised arguments and exhibits to support them. Apart from being a disingenuous presentation of his claims on appeal, by arguing the merits of these claims in his appellate brief, Avery failed to address the issue on appeal, which is whether the circuit court properly exercised its discretion in finding these claims procedurally barred and denying his post-October 3 motions without a hearing. What little argument Avery has provided on this point, again, reflects a misunderstanding of the procedural bar. The question is not whether Avery had all his evidence in hand in June 2017. That would amount to allowing defendants to escape the procedural bar by simply failing to investigate their available claims, which is what Wisconsin Statute 97406-4 was designed to prevent. Escalona, Naranjo. The question is whether all of Avery's claims, quote, could have been brought at the same time unquote, if he had completed his investigation before filing his Section 97406 motion. That means any claim that was available to if Avery could have discovered it by investigating it in June 2017, is procedurally barred. Since the answer to that question is yes, <clears throat> nearly all of Avery's later claims could have been raised in June 2017 if he had investigated them and particularly the multitude of new ineffective assistance claims, considering that an attorney can only be ineffective for failing to take actions available at the time of trial. Avery had to show a sufficient reason why these claims could not have been developed in June 2017 to overcome the procedural bar. See Aaron Allen. He also had to sufficiently plead the claims. Avery failed to do either in his motion or ap appellate brief. Moreover, Avery failed to recognize that in his June 2017 motion was not his first attempt at post-conviction relief. So Avery also had to provide sufficient material facts to show a sufficient reason why the claims raised in his motion for reconsideration could not have been raised on direct appeal or in his pro se motion. Avery made no real attempt to do that either, and to the extent he addressed it at all, he just made conclusory allegations of ineffective assistance of post-conviction counsel. In particular, Avery's unmade argument that he could not have raised in his June 2017 motion his claim that Strang and Buting were ineffective for failing to quote, investigate and impeach, unquote, Bobby Dassey based on Brian Dassey's discussion with, would fall flat, given that it is based on a police report made before trial. So does the underlying claim. The record, show, the record shows that trial counsel thoroughly cross-examined, including establishing that all he could say was he saw Hala taking a picture and then saw her Route 4 when he was leaving to go deer hunting. Avery's attorneys further discredited Bobby's testimony about Halbach being at the Avery property at 2.30 p.m. through Joellen Zipperer's testimony that Halbach could have been at the Zipperer household as late as 3.30 and through bus driver Lisa Buckner's testimony that she saw Halbach there while dropping off the Dassey boys from school. Buckner testified that her regular route put her at the Avery property at the same time every day, which was between 3.30 p.m. and 3.40 p.m. Avery fails to explain why a single statement that Brian Dassey told police that Bobby said he saw Halbach 
likely that would have tipped the scales when the wealth of other evidence pointed at Avery and when the jury already heard multiple other accounts that conflicted with Bobby Dassey's testimony. Avery's complaints about trial counsel not using Brian Dassey's statement to impeach Bobby simply amount to another claim that trial counsel was ineffective for to conduct the defense the way post-conviction counsel would have, which is insufficient to state a claim for ineffective assistance. Whether all. But again, the merits of this claim are, are not before this Scholar. The circuit court properly found that this claim was procedurally barred because there is no reason Avery could not have raised it in his June 2017 motion. That was a legally and factually sound decision. Denying this claim without a hearing was an appropriate exercise in dis of discretion and Avery has failed to show otherwise. Avery further asserts that the Dassey computer would have provided a possible third-party suspect defense that Bobby Dassey killed Ms. Haubach and that his forensic computer expert, Gary Hunt, found, quote, new evidence, unquote, on the computer to support that. But Avery, again, lacks a sufficient reason why he didn't raise this claim in his June 2017 motion or any of his previous post-conviction litigation. This evidence isn't new. Avery simply relied on the fact that Hunt used a 2017 forensic computer program to allege that his examination could not have been performed earlier. But when Hunt's program was available, it's not the question. When the information on the hard drive was capable of being found is the question and Hunt's own affidavit, affidavit states that was 2006. Hunt's affidavit acknowledges that the on-case forensic examination software technology was available and used in 2006, and that the quote, the corpus of data contained within the forensic image of the hard drive has not changed, unquote, since then. He further acknowledges that his investigation was guided by Fassbender's report about the state's pre-trial examination of the hard drive, finding this same material. If it could be found in 2006, it could be found, and the claim could have been raised about it at any time after that. At any rate, the fact that Hunt used a 2017 program would fail to show why this claim could not have been raised in Avery's June 2017 motion. Apart from the claims raised in Avery's post-October 3 motions that he had obscured by amalgamating elsewhere in his brief, Avery just lists some of the things he investigated after filing his June 2017 motion and again calls it, quote, new evidence, unquote. He claims that all of these belatedly raised issues, quote, were based on the discovery of the new evidence that was either withheld from Mr. Avery or through no fault of his own was not in Mr. Avery's possession at the time he filed his prior post-conviction motions. Avery's claim is false. The only reason this purported evidence was, quote, not in his possession at the time he filed his prior post-conviction motions, unquote, was because he failed to investigate these claims before filing. Newly discovered evidence, quote, does not include the new appreciation of the importance of evidence previously known but not used, unquote. And evidence previously known includes evidence that was, quote, knowable, unquote, by counsel. Boss now. None of this newly discovered evidence, it was all knowable by counsel inadmissible or, as explained in section two, below, immaterial. Avery easily could have procured these affidavits from Strang, Bates, Brad Dassey, and Blaine Dassey, and affidavits from Scott and Barb about whether Halbach left the Avery property had post-conviction counsel investigated all of Avery's claims before filing Avery's June 2017 motion and Scott and Barb Tadek's phone conversations with Avery, 
along with Barb Toddick's Facebook statement, are inadmissible hearsay. <clears throat> and therefore, they are not newly discovered evidence as a matter of no matter when they took place. State versus Bimbenic. Finally, Avery's claim that he, quote, that he found, quote, deletions, unquote, on the DASI computer was not raised in his 2017 motion for reconsideration. Indeed, Avery never raised any constitutional claim or developed any argument about this at all in any motion. This was a bare allegation in a letter Avery wrote to the circuit court in August 2018, indicating that he would not be supplementing his July 6, 2018 motion. Again, Avery cannot show that the circuit court erroneously exercised its discretion in denying a motion by relying on things not presented in that motion. The circuit court denied Avery's motion for reconsideration as procedurally barred for raising only claims that could have been brought in a single motion if Avery would have completed his investigation before filing his motion and failing to provide any reason, let alone a sufficient one, why he filed his Wisconsin Statute 97406 motion premature while knowing that he, quote, had substantial investigation to complete before having a full picture of all the evidence, unquote, he wanted the court to consider. That was a reasonable assessment by the circuit court, and denying these claims as procedurally barred was an appropriate exercise of discretion. Avery is due no relief. Two, Avery insufficiently pled his Brady claims about Heidel and Romlo, which are nevertheless meritless. Avery claims that he could not have included his Brady claims based on Romlo's or Heidel's information in his June 2017 motion because they did not provide their information until after he filed it. Even assuming that could be a sufficient reason for failing to raise these claims then, and assuming these events actually happen, Avery did not establish that either of these affidavits provided material evidence, and therefore they cannot support a Brady claim. The defense does not show a Brady violation by showing that the prosecutor failed, quote, to disclose evidence favorable to the accused no matter how insignificant, unquote. United States v. Bagley. Evidence is only material if, quote, there is a reasonable probability that had the evidence been disclosed to the defense, the result of the proceeding would have been different, unquote. The Supreme Court adopted that standard directly from Strickland, Bagley. And to meet that standard, quote, it is not enough for the defendant to show that the errors had some conceivable effect on the outcome of the proceeding, unquote, Strickland. But that is all Avery alleged for either Heidel or Romlo, and even that was based on speculation that had no basis. In Heidel's affidavit says Ms. Halbach, quote, pulled over to check her calendar, unquote as she was on the phone with Heidel at 11.35 a.m. on the day of her murder. Nowhere does Heidel say that Halbach was, quote, making notations in her day planner, unquote, as Avery. Avery claims that Halbach making notes in her day planner would help tie Hillegas to the murder because a, quote, friend, unquote, said Hillegas had Ms. Halbach's day planner after the murder. But that is also false. The friend said Hillegas, quote, had found a schedule of Halbox for the week of October 31 to November 6, unquote. Nothing suggests that what Hillegas had was her day planner. <clears throat> Avery further assumes, with no support, that Halbach can't have kept more than one copy of her schedule. Avery then claims that Heidel's affidavit shows that Halbach's day planner was in the Rob 4. It doesn't. Assumes it must have stayed there until after the murder. There are no facts to support this. Assumes that the, quote, schedule, 
unquote, Hilligus found was the day planner. There are no facts to support this either. Leaps to the conclusion that Heidel's affidavit shows that Hilligus retrieved whatever schedule he had from the RAV4, again with no factual support, and claims this would have allowed him to meet the Denny third-party suspect test for him by providing a direct connection to the crime. <clears throat> Apart from relying on too many speculative leaps to count, and therefore failing to allege what was needed for a hearing, Avery failed to allege any facts showing that there is a reasonable probability that Heidel's testimony would have led to a different outcome of the trial even if Avery's many misrepresentations were true. He simply proclaimed it would have done so, which is nothing more than a conclusory allegation. Materiality requires more. See State B. Wire. There was an overwhelming amount of evidence against Avery, and he failed to explain why it reasonably probable that he was, would have prevailed at trial if Heidel told the jury Halbach said she was, quote, <clears throat> checking her calendar, unquote, during a phone conversation, especially considering that Avery has uniformly failed to suggest how Hilligus or anyone else realistically could have acquired Avery's blood from his sink and then planted it in the Rob 4 and failed to provide anything directly connecting anyone else to the crime. Avery's claims about Romlo suffer similar flaws. Avery did not allege anything showing a reasonable probability of a different outcome at trial. Romlo simply said he saw a car on the side of the road that he thought matched, quote, the written description of Ms. Halbach's Rob 4, unquote, on a missing persons poster at the gas station. So assuming Romlo's contentions are true, Romlo never even knew what Ms. Halbach's car actually looked like because he never saw a picture. There is not a reasonable probability that a jury would have acquitted Avery if counsel produced Romlo just to say he saw a car parked on the road that he thought was similar to a written description of a car he never actually saw. And Avery has again misunderstood what he had to show. He says only that Romlo's testimony, quote, supports trial defense counsel's theory that the Rob 4 was planted, unquote, on Avery's property, and further alleges that Romlo seeing a similar car on a road somehow inexplicably shows that, quote, it was possible to access the Avery property and plant the vehicle, unquote. Setting aside that Romlo seeing a similar car somewhere fails to establish any fact about the Rob 4 being planted or accessibility to the Avery property, let alone a material fact, what Avery alleges again amounts to only a conceivable effect on the proceeding at best, and that is insufficient. Strickland. Once more, Avery has tried to cure the deficiencies in his motions by adding new allegations in his brief. He now attempts to rely on another affidavit from a, quote, Paul Burdick that Avery procured, quote, on June 28, 2018, unquote, to corroborate Romlo's tale. Obviously, the court did not have this affidavit when it denied his Brady claim about Romlo in November 2017. Therefore, Avery cannot rely on it to show the circuit court a Erroneously exercised its discretion in denying Avery's 2017 claim about Romlo. Further, when Avery filed this affidavit in 2018, he buried it in a pile of exhibits with no argument or even any mention of it in the motion then at issue. <clears throat> Avery cannot show that the circuit court improperly denied his October and November 2017 claims based on documents he did not provide the court until eight months later and then made no argument about, nor can he rely on new arguments in his appellate brief. Sean Shedd. The circuit court articulated a legally and factually sound rationale 
court determining that Avery's motion for reconsideration raised only claims and arguments that were procedurally barred, and thus refusing to hold an evidentiary hearing on them. Moreover, the record conclusively demonstrates that Avery's, quote, new evidence, unquote, was only new because he did not exercise due diligence to discover it before filing his motion, that the claims were insufficiently pled and meritless at any Avery has provided nothing to the contrary. Accordingly, this court must affirm the circuit court's discretionary decision to deny Avery's motion for reconsideration without a hearing. Roman numeral four. The circuit court properly exercised its discretion when it denied, without a hearing, Avery's July 2018 motion regarding Detective Veeley's compilation of items copied from the DASI computer. On July 6, 2018, Avery filed his fifth collateral attack post-conviction motion in the circuit court. This time, he alleged that the state violated Brady by failing to provide him with a CD containing copies of material that Detective Mike Veeley located on the DASI hard drive in 2006. Avery claimed that this CD contained exculpatory material evidence that was, quote, directly relevant to the credibility of Bobby Dassey, unquote, and would have allowed him to raise a third-party perpetrator defense alleging Bobby committed the crime and therefore the state's failure to disclose it violated his due process right to a fair The circuit court denied the motion without a hearing finding that Avery failed to show that any evidence was suppressed by the state because everything on the Veeley CD was copied from the forensic copy of the DASI hard drive that the state turned over to the defense. The circuit court further rejected Avery's claim that the forensic copy of the hard drive was disclosed too late for effective use, noting that it was turned over two months before trial, along with Special Agent Fassbender's report summarizing what was found. Avery, quote, made the strategic decision to rely on the opinion of the prosecutor, unquote, about the import of that evidence, rather than review the evidence himself. And he cannot show the prosecution deliberately misled him about it or withheld anything. The circuit court did not erroneously exercise its discretion when it denied this motion without a hearing. In Brady, the United States Supreme Court held that, quote, the suppression by the prosecution of favorable to an accused upon request violates due process where the evidence is material either to guilt or to punishment, irrespective of the good faith or bad faith of the prosecution, unquote. Brady. In State v. Kevin Harris, the Wisconsin Supreme Court stated the three prerequisites a defendant must establish to prevail on a Brady claim. One, the evidence at issue must be favorable to the accused, either because it is exculpatory or it is impeaching. Two, the evidence must have been suppressed by the state, meaning the defendant must not have had it in time to make effective use of the evidence. And Three, the evidence must be material, meaning that, quote, there is a reasonable probability that had the evidence been disclosed to the defense, the result of the proceeding would have been different. A reasonable probability is a probability sufficient to undermine confidence in the outcome, unquote. Kevin Harris, Avery's Brady claim must fail because he can meet no part of the test. First, as the circuit court correctly observed, the state did not suppress anything. It turned over, two months prior to trial, a complete copy of the DASI hard drive and Fassbender's report, alerting Avery to what was found on it. Avery does not dispute this. And the Veeley CD contained only copies of the pictures and search terms Veeley located on the hard drive. Indeed, 
Avery's own expert, Gary Hunt's affidavit admits that, quote, the information contained on the CD is derived from the forensic image contained across the DVDs, unquote. Quote, in my opinion, based upon a reasonable degree of certainty in the field of computer forensics science, the CD contains information and files extracted from the seven DVDs that, in Detective Veely's opinion, were relevant to the investigation of Ms. Halbach's murder, unquote. And there is no dispute that Avery has always had the DVDs. The state further provided Avery with Fassbender's report disclosing the results of Veely's investigation and informing Avery the state kept Veely's CD. The report stated that on the computer, the state located, quote, photographs of both Teresa Halbach and Stephen Avery, unquote. Quote, numerous images of nudity, both male and female, to include pornography, unquote, which, quote, included both heterosexual, homosexual, and bestiality, unquote. Fassbender's report also informed Avery that the hard drive contained, quote, images depicting bondage as well as possible torture and pain, unquote. Quote, images depicting potential young females, unquote. Quote, images of injuries to humans to include a decapitated head, a badly injured and bloody body, a bloody head injury, and a mutilated body, unquote. The report further states that, quote, the disc received from Detective Veely, as well as the hard copy pages of instant message conversations, were maintained in Special Agent Fassbender's possession, unquote. The record also shows that the prosecution discussed Veely's investigation with Avery's trial counsel before trial, meaning they were clearly aware of it. The state certainly does not, quote, admit that the CD was suppressed, unquote, from May 10, 2006 until April 17, 2018. As Avery claimed, to, quote, disclose, unquote, means, quote, to make known or public, unquote, or, quote, exposed to view, unquote. Avery claims to, to explain how the state, quote, suppressed, unquote, something it told him about, described, discussed, and provided him with all the contents of well before trial. In other words, the definition of, quote, disclosed, unquote. Avery does not point to items of evidence he did not have that were on the Beely CD, but not the hard drive. He just complains that he could not have, quote, guessed, unquote, what search terms Beely used during his examination, but that is not what he is entitled to under Brady. The state must provide the defendant with the evidence, Brady. Here, that means the hard drive containing these items, and there is no dispute that the state, Brady does not require the state to walk the defense through how to evaluate the evidence, nor to do their trial preparation for them. And that is really all Avery complains he lacked. But it is the material on the hard drive, again, that is the evidence that Avery claims he could have used to impeach or establish Bobby Dassey as a Denny suspect. Avery always had that, along with Fassbender's report telling him it was there. The notion that Avery was deprived of the evidence because although he had the evidence itself, and had the state's summary of the evidence, he did not have a copy of the state's copy of the is absurd. Avery's argument is akin to saying that if the state made a one-page test sheet with thumbnails of the crime scene photos, it found relevant that it kept for itself and provided him with a summary of the relevant photo evidence and full-size copies of all the crime scene photos in a sealed envelope that he did not bother to open it, quote, suppressed, unquote, the photo evidence because it did not give him the state's test sheet of the thumbnails. That defies common sense. The circuit court properly determined 
that the state did not suppress any evidence favorable to Avery. Avery makes no real argument that he did not have possession of this evidence, likely because he cannot dispute that he did. Indeed, Avery's own expert, Gary Hunt, attested that he found this very same evidence during his independent examination of the hard drive in 2017, before he even had Bailey's CD. Perhaps recognizing that he cannot make a credible claim that the state suppressed evidence that he had in his possession two months before trial, and that his attorneys discussed with the prosecutor, Avery pivots to alleging that though he had the evidence in his possession, he did not have it in time to, quote, effectively identify a motive in its Denny motion filed on January 8, 2007, unquote, and alleges that the state, quote, deliberately misled, unquote, him about the contents of the hard drive. Both contentions are unsupported. The circuit court did not, quote, ignore, unquote, Avery's argument that trial counsel received the hard drive too late to use it. It found that Avery had it months before trial and opted to do nothing with it. That was an accurate assessment of the Avery complains that Bealey's investigation was completed several months before he received the hard drive. But that is so. Quote, immediate disclosure is not required under Brady, unquote. Kevin Harris. Brady does not require that the defendant be provided with the evidence on his own timeline either. It requires, quote, that the prosecution disclose evidence to the defendant in time for its effective use, unquote. State B. Rennell Harris. Avery alleged nothing showing that he did not receive the hard drive in time for its effective use. The state sent Avery the seven DVDs and Fassbender's report explaining what was found on them on December 14. That was seven weeks before trial and nearly four weeks before Avery filed his Denny motion. It took Feely only 16 days to perform his examination of the hard drive. Avery provided nothing explaining why 10 days was too short a time to procure a computer expert who then would have had just as much time as the state's expert to examine the hard drive before the motion's deadline, or that Avery even tried to find one. Avery and the motion's date is not set in stone. If Avery needed more time to assess the hard drive in order to effectively develop his Denny motion, he could have, and he should have, asked the court to extend the motion's deadline and possibly adjourn the trial date if necessary. Avery made no showing that he asked for more time to investigate, indicated that he could not assess the hard drive, or said anything about trying to investigate the hard drive at any point. Finally, nothing precluded Avery from seeking to amend his motion after it was filed. If he found anything relevant on the hard drive, he did not attempt to do that either. In short, Avery had the hard drive and plenty of time to make effective use of it before trial. He just did not attempt to do so. And contrary to Avery's suggestion, the state did not, quote, deliberately mislead, unquote, anyone about what was on the hard drive. It provided the defense with Fassbender's report revealing all of this information and discussed with strength that it did not believe the investigation turned up much of evidentiary value. There was an accurate assessment, and Strang agreed. The circuit court did not, quote, ignore, unquote, this argument either. The circuit court explained that Strang's discussions with the state showed that he knew what was found and did not think it was irrelevant. That the circuit court rejected Avery's arguments does not mean it overlooked them. In short, the state disclosed and provided to Avery both the evidence itself and a summary of what the state found on the hard drive. It further disclosed that it kept a copy of Vili's itemization of these things. 
It discussed Vili's investigation with Avery's attorneys and whether Vili would be a necessary witness. The bottom line is neither the prosecution nor the defense found the pornography and other computer evidence relevant to their case. The fact that Avery would like to create a different trial defense out of it now does not mean that the state suppressed or misled him about it. Moreover, Avery has again failed to establish that the contents of the Vili CD were material. To show that something is material, Avery had to show that there's a reasonable probability that the outcome of the trial would have been different if the defendant had the evidence, which again, Avery had in hand and simply ignored. The evidence from the hard drive would not have altered the outcome of Avery's trial. Avery claims the pornography and violent images and search terms would have impeached Bobby Dassey's credibility. But he fails to explain how. The fact that someone views violent pornography does not diminish their credibility as a witness, as Avery claims. Though distasteful, it has nothing to do with their truthfulness. Nor would viewing violent pornography refute anything about Bobby's claim that he never saw Ms. Halbach leave the Avery property. Moreover, Avery's claim that this evidence would have impeached Bobby about his timeline of events fails to recognize that this would be cumulative. Bobby's timeline of events was refuted by multiple other witnesses who testified. There is not a reasonable probability that the outcome of the trial would have been different if Avery used this pornography to, quote, impeach, unquote, Bobby Dassey. Avery's discussion about Bobby's 2017 interview with law enforcement is irrelevant to his claim. Nothing about an interview conducted 10 years later can possibly be relevant to the plausible outcome of Avery's 2007 if Avery had Bailey's CD then. Avery's materiality argument severely oversells Bobby Dassey's testimony as well. He was far from, quote, the state's primary witness, unquote. As explained above, there was a wealth of forensic evidence pointing directly at Avery, which the state established through 14 expert witnesses, law enforcement officers, and several other citizen witnesses. Avery doesn't explain why Bobby Dassey's testimony saying he did not see Halbach leave the property was the critical evidence tying Avery to the crime, rather than the fact that Avery's blood was found in the victim's hidden car, his DNA was found in multiple places on it. The victim's remains were found in his burn pit. The victim's personal property was found in his burn barrel. And the victim's DNA was on a bullet fired from a gun in his possession. Nor does he explain how Bobby was the, quote, primary witness, unquote, and not the other members of his family or citizen witnesses who testified, many of whom contradicted Bobby, or the countless law enforcement officers and experts who collected and evaluated the evidence. Even if Bobby said nothing, or if the defense put forth cumulative witnesses to, quote, impeach, unquote, Bobby further, the state still would have made a compelling case that Ms. Halbach never left the property. At no point has Avery ever shown that there is a reasonable probability <clears throat> a Denny defense would have succeeded either. Indeed, Avery has again failed to show that he even would have prevailed on a Denny motion had this evidence been included in the motion. Setting aside Strang and Beating's belated revelations about how crucial this pornography on the computer was, though for some unexplained reason they took no steps to analyze it, despite discussing it with the prosecution and Fassbender's report, clearly alerting them it was there. Avery still has not established how the pornography and other violent images would establish a motive to murder Ms. Hobbock nor established anything directly connecting Bobby to the crime. First, Avery cites 
and in apposite law to attempt to establish his proposition that pornography establishes a motive for murder. Dressler B. McCautry, on which he relies, is a non-binding Seventh Circuit federal habeas corpus case that addressed whether introducing at the defendant's murder trial under Wisconsin Statute 904 the defendant's other acts of owning violent videos violated the First Amendment. Dressler. Absent from Avery's appellate brief is any discussion of any Wisconsin case actually discussing the Denny Standard. Even if Dressler were relevant, Avery still doesn't offer anything showing that pornography consumption would have established a motive in this case. He says with no support that, quote, an obsession with images depicting sexual violence, unquote, which he never pled any fact showing that anyone had, quote, made it more likely that person would commit a sexual homicide, unquote. But his expert simply states that there is a connection between pornography consumption and violent behavior. That is insufficient to establish a motive for murder. Nor did Avery offer anything that would establish a direct connection to the crime. Direct connection requires, quote, evidence that the alleged third-party perpetrator actually committed the crime, unquote. State B. Wilson. In other words, it has to, quote, firm up the defendant's theory of the crime and take it beyond mere speculation, unquote. And there is literally no evidence connecting Bobby Dassey to this crime. Avery's claims are, again, nothing but, quote, mere speculation, unquote, unsupported by any facts. Avery has never pointed to anything directly connecting Bobby Dassey to any of the evidence at all, and therefore he's offered nothing showing, quote, a legitimate tendency, unquote. Bobby Dassey committed the crime. Wilson. Avery has particularly failed to offer anything showing that Bobby Dassey, or anyone else, somehow had the tools and ability to collect his blood from the sink on which his new defense relies. The fact that Avery has now pointed the finger at five different people during these shows that there is no evidence actually connecting anyone else to the crime, let alone anyone in particular, as is required to raise a Denny defense. <clears throat> Indeed, multiple places elsewhere in his brief he claims Hillegas, not Bobby Dassey, was the real perpetrator. Instead, Avery just proclaims that if he established motive for Bobby Dassey, he would prevail on Denny, and assumes that means he would prevail at trial. But Denny is a three-pronged test and requires a legitimate showing that the third person committed the including showing a direct connection. And Brady requires a showing that there is a reasonable probability that a Denny defense using the computer contents and accusing Bobby Dassey would have succeeded. Avery has not made either showing. Moreover, Avery overlooks the fact that attorney Buting told the jury that Bobby Dassey could have been the killer during closing argument. He noted that Bobby stated they only had three burn barrels, but four were outside of he pointed out that Bobby, too, had a 22 rifle in his bedroom. He illustrated for the jury that Bobby's timeline did not match up with anyone else's and argued that Bobby couldn't know that Scott Toddick would know, quote, precisely when they passed each other on the road unless they concocted a story about it together, that no one going deer hunting would shower beforehand, and that Bobby was home by 5 o'clock before Deer would be out. He then specifically suggested Bobby was the killer. The jury heard this theory, coupled with a far more believable planting defense than Avery's new. Even if Avery further discredited Bobby or presented Avery's new, quote, the killer planted the blood evidence, unquote, defense, and alleged that Bobby was the killer because he allegedly viewed violent pornography and there is no probability of a different result at 
trial. But again, it does not matter the contents of the BBCD were material because nothing was suppressed. Everything on the CD came from the hard drive, which Avery undeniably had in his possession. Avery also had the state's report showing what the state found on the hard drive. Avery was not entitled to the state's distillation of the evidence. He was entitled to the evidence, which is what he received. Avery had everything on the Beely CD in hand two months before trial. Avery's Brady claim simply fails. He established no part of the test. Avery's claim that this is somehow newly discovered evidence fails multiple prongs of that test as well. Avery cannot possibly establish that he was not necessary in seeking the evidence when Fassbender's report telling him what Vili found on the hard drive and alerting him that the state kept the CD was in the record both before trial and the whole 12 years that passed since then. The Vili CD is also cumulative with the hard drive that Avery had in his possession the whole time. Finally, as explained, Avery has not established that there is any probability that the result of his trial would have been different had he presented a porn-based defense that Bobby was the killer and planted the evidence. The CD is not newly discovered evidence. Finally, there is no, quote, cumulative effect of the Brady violations because Avery did not establish any Brady violations. As explained previously, Avery failed to allege sufficient facts showing that the zipper or CD, Redon's testimony, the flyover video, Heidel's information, or Ramos' information were exculpatory or material. All the facts he alleged about these things were pure speculation that did not follow from any facts in the record or even from the affidavits he submitted. Accordingly, there cannot be any cumulative effect of these, quote, violations, unquote, because Avery did not establish any violations. Quote, adding them together adds nothing. Zero plus zero equals zero, unquote. Mintec v. State. Roman numeral five, the circuit court properly exercised its discretion in denying Avery's March 2019 motion without a hearing. In his March 2019 motion, Avery sought reversal and a new trial on an alleged violation of Arizona v. Youngblood. The basis for his claim was that the state effectively destroyed evidence by releasing bone fragments found in a court to the Hobbock family in 2011, and thus he can no longer seek and possibly obtain post-conviction DNA testing of that evidence. In considering Avery's motion, the circuit court made the following findings of facts. Bone fragments found in the quarry were released to the Hobbock family after trial. The bone fragments were previously examined by Dr. Leslie Eisenberg, who had produced reports of her findings and testified at trial. In Dr. Eisenberg's December 6, 2006 report, she identified what material supplied for analysis contained human bone fragments and what material was other than human in origin. The individuals involved in releasing the bone fragments to the Halbach family used Dr. Eisenberg's report to select what material would be given to the Halbach family. Dr. Eisenberg's testimony at trial, however, qualified the, the findings in her report. <clears throat> Dr. Eisenberg's trial testimony established that none of the material found in the quarry could definitively be identified as human bone, and the FBI confirmed that the fragments could not be tested for DNA to determine whether the fragments could be identified as or identified as those of the victim. From those facts, the circuit court made the reasonable inference that, quote, there was no scientific evidence or record at the time that the material was released 
to support that human biological material was being released or that the material was known to be the remains of the victim, unquote. The circuit court then analyzed Avery's claim and denied his motion without a hearing. The circuit court's rationale for doing so will be addressed in the subsections below. This court should affirm the circuit court's decision to deny the motion without a hearing for three reasons. First, Avery's claim is procedurally barred. Second, even if it is not barred, it is not cognizable in a Wisconsin statute 97406 motion. Third, even if there was a procedural mechanism for Avery to obtain relief, his claim would fail on the merits. Avery's claim is procedurally barred because he has not established a sufficient reason for not bringing his claim in any of his prior post-conviction motions. The circuit court concluded, based on this court's remand order, that Avery's claim was not procedurally that conclusion was incorrect. As this court is aware, if a ground for relief was not raised or incompletely raised in a prior post-conviction motion or direct appeal, it may not become the basis for a new post-conviction motion unless the defendant can demonstrate sufficient reason why the new argument was not previously raised. Wisconsin Statute 97406 Escalona Avery could have raised any claim regarding the bone fragment when Avery filed his second Wisconsin Statute 97406 motion on June 7, 2017. His motion for reconsideration between October 23, 2017 and November 17, 2017. Or his third Section 97406 motion filed July 6, 2018. Had Avery attempted to investigate whether the bone fragment could be determined to be human before filing any of these motions, he would have learned of their disposal and could have raised this claim in any of them. Even absent his request to test the fragments, Avery had the information that the fragments were given to the hall box before he filed his July 6, 2018 motion. On April 19, 2018, Avery's private investigator, James R. Kirby, filed a Freedom of Information Act FOIA request with the Calumet County Sheriff's Department requesting, among other things, all investigative reports on the Avery case beginning October 31, 2005 through the date of the request, April 19, 2018. The reports were mailed to Mr. Kirby on May 29, 2018. Included in the investigative reports was the report of evidence custodian Jeremy Hall detailing the disposition of certain bone fragment evidence. The report was dated September 20, 2011. Deputy Hawkins' report is numbered pages 1114 one, uh, 1, to 1115. Current post conviction counsel acknowledged receiving the investigative reports on or about May 30th, 2018. In her motion to compel filed in this court on July 3, 2018. Armed with this additional information, current post-conviction counsel could have and should have filed a motion in the Court of Appeal asking for leave to expand the scope of the remand order issued by the Court of Appeals on June 7, 2018 to include claims based on the disposition return of the bone fragment. Avery did not provide a sufficient reason or in for failing to invest and raise this claim in his prior motions. The circuit court should have denied Avery's motion as procedurally barred. And this court should do so now because it can affirm on alternative grounds. See hold. B. If the circuit court chooses not to apply the procedural bar, Avery's claim is not cognizable on collateral review. 
If this court declines to apply the procedural bar, it should nonetheless conclude that Avery cannot raise this claim in a Wisconsin statute 97406 motion. First, Avery cannot raise a statutory claim in a Wisconsin statute 97406 motion, State v. Carter. A motion under section 97406 is limited to jurisdictional and constitutional issues, Ballyette. So, quote, an alleged statutory violation is beyond the scope of a section 97406 motion, unquote, Carter. Avery's statutory claim has no cognizable constitutional or jurisdictional claim. Avery's claim that the state violated Wisconsin statute 968.2052 also fails on the merits. Respectfully, the circuit court decision to the contrary was incorrect. Wisconsin statute 968.2052 reads, except as provided in, in if physical evidence that is in the possession of a law enforcement agency includes any biological material that was collected in connection with a criminal investigation that resulted in a criminal conviction, delinquency, adjudication, or commitment under a 971.17 or 980.06, and the biological material is from a victim of the offense that was the subject of the criminal investigation, or may reasonably be used to or exculpate any person for the defense for the offense, the law enforcement agency shall preserve the physical evidence until every person in custody as a result of the conviction, adjudication, or commitment has reached his or her discharge date. The state preserved the biological material that was from the victim or that could be used to incriminate or exculpate any person of the, the state preserved samples of the bone fragments that were clearly identified as being female human bone fragments. The state also preserved crime lab item BZ, the thigh bone fragment collected from the Avery burn pit with attached human tissue. Subsequent nuclear DNA testing developed a partial DNA profile that was consistent with the nuclear DNA profile of Teresa Halbach. Additionally, the state preserved two tubs of cranial fragments, occipital and parietal bones showing high velocity bullet impact and lead spray, and fragments identified as facial bone reflective of human female skeletal anatomy. Section 968.2052 cannot be interrupted as a mandate to preserve and hold every single piece of biological evidence recovered during an investigation from any source. When interpreting a statute, a court gives words and phrases their, quote, common, ordinary, and accepted meaning, unquote. State Kalal v. Circuit Court. And a court is to interpret statutory language reasonably, quote, to avoid absurd or unreasonable results, unquote. To read section 968.2052 as requiring the preservation of all biological material, what would read the conjunctive, quote, and, unquote, out of the statute and would place an unreasonable, if not impossible, burden upon law enforcement. Law enforcement cannot be expected to indefinitely preserve biological material that had no identifiable connection to the crime. None of the bone fragments recovered from locations in the quarry were positively identified as let alone the remains of Teresa Hall. Section 968.2052 does not mandate the preservation of suspect, unknown, or undetermined biological evidence. Therefore, the state was under no obligation to preserve those bone fragments. There is also no claim that the bone fragments could, quote, reasonably be used to incriminate or exculpate any person for the offense, unquote. 
Wisconsin Statute 968.2052, the bone fragments alone, if tested, would not prove every innocent or guilty, nor anyone else. In short, Avery's claim that the state violated Wisconsin Statute 968.205 is not cognizable in a Wisconsin Statute 97406 motion, and the state did not violate Wisconsin Statute 968.205 when it released some of the quarry bone fragments to the Halbach family for burial. Second, Avery has not asserted a true constitutional. Avery's motion is based on the premise that if the bones that were released to the family could be tested, and if those tests produced results favorable to Avery, those test results might exonerate Avery. Youngblood itself expressly rejected the type of claim Avery brings to this court. The Supreme Court reasoned, quote, We think the due process clause requires a different when we deal with the failure of the state to preserve evidentiary material, of which no more can be said than that it could have been, could have been subjected to tests, the results of which might have exonerated the defendant. Unquote. Young blood. Part of the reason the court distinguished these types of claims, quote, is found in the observation made by the court in Trombetta that whenever potentially exculpatory evidence is permanently, courts face the treacherous task of divining the import of materials whose contents are unknown and very often disputed, unquote. Another part stemmed from the court's, quote, unwillingness to read the fundamental fairness requirement of the due process clause as imposing on the police an undifferentiated and absolute duty to retain and preserve all material that might be of conceivable evidentiary significance in a particular prosecution, unquote. Avery's claim is not cognizable. Moreover, young blood and its progeny do not apply to the post-trial destruction of evidence. The Supreme Court's, quote, decision in District Attorney's Office for the 3rd Judicial District v. Osborne indicates that an individual does not have a right under the Due Process Clause to access lost or destroyed evidence during post-conviction proceedings, unquote. Read the state. Osborne sought access to state evidence so that he could apply new DNA testing technology that might prove him. Osborne claimed he had a due process right to access evidence during post-conviction proceedings so that he could do further testing. However, the Supreme Court rejected his invitation to recognize a freestanding liberty right to DNA evidence testing and post-conviction proceedings. Osborne. The court determined once a defendant has been proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, he does not have the same liberty interests as a free man. The court further opined that establishing such a right would raise other issues, such as whether there is a constitutional obligation to preserve evidence post-conviction, which it was unwilling to recognize. Establishing a freestanding right to access DNA evidence for testing would force us to act as policymakers, and our substantive due process rulemaking authority would not only have to cover the right to access, but a myriad of other issues. We would soon have to decide if there is a constitutional obligation to preserve forensic evidence that might later be tested. Arizona v. Youngblood. If so, for how long? Would it be different for different types of evidence? Would the state also have some obligation to gather such evidence in the first place? Since there is no procedural or substantive due process right to conduct DNA testing and no recognized constitutional obligation on the state to preserve forensic evidence after trial, Avery has no basis to claim this claim in Section 97406, Wisconsin Statute. 974061. Avery's argument to the contrary is not persuasive. 
So in his post-conviction motion, Avery spent much time and effort arguing the state violated his due process rights when it disposed of some of the bone fragments recovered during the investigation. He asserted that young blood and its progeny do apply to post-conviction proceedings, citing State v. Parker. The circuit court agreed. <clears throat> a quick read of Parker does suggest that a due process violation may result from the destruction of evidence after. In Parker, post-conviction counsel learned that a tape of the alleged drug transaction between Parker and an undercover officer that was not used at trial had been destroyed. Parker. On appeal, Parker, that destruction of the tape denied his due process right to a meaningful appeal and effective assistance of appellate counsel. The Parker decision contains no citation to Youngblood, but this court wrote, quote, the parties have not cited to, nor have we located, any case law addressing this post-trial destruction of evidence. There is a long line of cases addressing the pre-trial destruction of evidence and a defendant's due process rights. We see no, no reason why this line of case should not apply to the situation at hand, unquote. There, there is a very good reason not to apply pre-trial destruction of evidence cases to the post-trial destruction of the due process concern in the pre-trial destruction of evidence cases concerns, quote, the defendant's right to fundamental fairness by giving the defendant a chance to present a complete defense, unquote. State B. Greenwald. Avery had his trial. He is not arguing that his trial was not fair because of some issues with the, those bones, nor that he did not have the opportunity to present a complete defense. He is simply arguing that he might have a different or stronger defense if, and it's a big if, the bone fragments could be tested and the testing revealed that the fragments belong to the victim. Moreover, and more problematically, the Parker decision is internally inconsistent. While the court reasoned with no analysis, that there was no reason not to apply the pretrial destruction of evidence cases to a post-conviction claim. It also concluded, citing an earlier Court of Appeals decision that, quote, a defendant may not sit back while, may not sit back while evidence is available and then argue for a new trial on the grounds that evidence is no longer available to him or her, unquote. Parker. The state sees no way to reconcile these inconsistent holdings. Holt predates Parker, and thus Holt is controlling. See state Kempi Nen. When a decision of the Court of Appeals cannot be reconciled with an older decision, the older decision controls. Holt was charged and convicted in Illinois for aggravated kidnapping, battery, and felony murder and then years later, charged in Wisconsin for acts involving kidnapping, sexual assault, and murder of the victim. After the trial in Illinois, vaginal swabs taken from the victim during the autopsy were destroyed. In Holt's Wisconsin trial, the prosecution introduced testimony about destroyed vaginal swabs. Holt. Holt alleges that he was denied due when the prosecution was allowed to introduce testimony about the swabs because, quote, the state had not preserved the swabs for analysis by, unquote. The due process issue in Holt was whether the post-trial destruction of evidence is a cognizable due process claim when the defendant is facing a new trial. Even in that circumstance, this court held that Regardless, if Holt could establish the trombetta elements, he had no due process. Quote, a defendant may not sit back for years while evidence is available and then successfully move to suppress testimony about such evidence on the ground that the evidence is no longer available to the defendant for further test. Unquote. Like Holt, Avery has no due process claim. There is no constitutional mandate that the state preserve evidence post-trial 
for further potential testing. And Avery sat back for over a before requesting further testing on the fragments. For Parker conflicts with Osborne. This court must follow a United States Supreme Court decision on a matter of federal law if it conflicts with an earlier Wisconsin appellate decision. State v. Jennings. As just explained, Osborne shows that there is no constitutional right to post-conviction testing. Osborne. The Osborne court indicated that young blood had not created a constitutional obligation on law enforcement to preserve evidence post-conviction. Osborne controls over Parker. Under Osborne, Avery has no cognizable young blood, young blood claim because his claim alleges post-conviction destruction of evidence. And without a constitutional claim, Avery has no justiciable basis for his Wisconsin statute 97406 motion. C. Even if young blood applied to the post-conviction destruction of evidence, which it does not, Avery has not met his pleading burden. Quote, in order to secure a hearing on a post-conviction motion, a defendant must have provided sufficient material facts. For example, who, what, when, where, why, and how that if would entitle him to the relief he, unquote, John Allen. A, quote, a material fact, a fact that is significant or essential to the issue or matter at hand, unquote. Avery was required to allege sufficient material facts, quote, within the four corners of the post-conviction motion itself, unquote. As with his other claims, Avery failed to meet his burden. There is a well-developed body of Wisconsin case law that follows the, and applies to Trombetta and Youngblood. To put it succinctly, quote, a defendant's due process rights are violated if the state, one, failed to preserve the evidence that is apparently exculpatory, or two, acted in bad faith by failing to preserve evidence which is potentially exculpatory, unquote. State v. Puget. Trombetta and Youngblood addressed the due process analysis applicable to the pretrial loss or destruction of evidence. Under Trombetta, due process is violated when the defendant shows that the state lost evidence before trial that might be expected to play a significant role in the defense. Trombetta. To satisfy this standard, the, the evidence must possess an exculpatory value that was before the evidence was lost or destroyed and be of such a nature that the defendant would be unable to obtain comparable evidence by other reasonably available means. Evidence does not have apparent exculpatory value if it would have provided, quote, simply an avenue of investigation that might have led in any number of directions. Hugh Banks v. Frank, quoting Youngblood. The first step in the analysis, then, is whether the bone fragments recovered from the quarry constitute exculpatory evidence. They do not. The bone fragments are not apparently or potentially exculpatory in any way. Avery has not established how these bone fragments are anything other than an avenue of investigation that might lead in any number of directions. Over the course of the past two and a half since the filing of the original motion for post-conviction scientific testing on August 26, 26, Avery has changed his theory of who the, quote, real murderer, unquote, is at least three times. Initially, the focus was on individual A, later determined to be Joshua Redont, and individual B, later determined to be Scott Blade. Avery then shifted focus to Ryan Hilligus, who he described as the quote only unquote person who could have committed the crime and absolved Redont in a footnote. Shortly thereafter, in the summer and fall of 2017, Avery turned his attention to Bob and Scott Tadek. 
Since that time, Avery claimed Bobby Dassey and Tyler are the killers. Notably, Bobby Dassey and Scott Tyler were included in trial counsel's original third-party liability as viable suspects. On appeal, Avery has added Hillegas back to the equation as well. Avery asserts only that if testing revealed that the bone fragments in the quarry belonged to the victim, it would establish that the victim's remains were not under Avery's, quote, exclusive control. That is a conclusory assertion unsupported by any facts. Avery never explains why, if the bone fragments belonged to the victim, it would be impossible for Avery to have planted the fragments in the quarry, or how his not having exclusive control of the victim's remains after the murder would establish or even suggest that Avery was not the real killer. He fails to argue how the existence of human bone fragments found in the quarry support any of his arguments that individual A, Scott Bladorn, Ryan Hillegas, Bobby Dassey, or Scott Tuttock is the real killer. Thus, the only thing Avery has established is that testing the bone fragments found in the quarry may lead to an investigation that could go in any number of directions. He has not established how the bone fragment evidence has apparent exculpatory value. Q Banks. Avery tries to do an end run around the apparently exculpatory analysis by asserting that the bone fragment evidence is material evidence because the combination of Wisconsin Statute 96A20 and 97407 codified a right to post-conviction DNA testing. Whether evidence is material has nothing to do with those statutes. Constitutionally, material evidence means evidence that creates a reasonable probability that if the evidence had been available to the defense, the result of the trial would have been different. Bad. But the bone fragments were available to the defense, and they did not make a difference at trial. The bone fragments were not apparently exculpated. Additionally, there are fragments from the quarry that may or may not be human, still in evidence, available for testing. Thus, Avery has also failed to establish that he cannot obtain comparable evidence for testing. Regarding the, quote, potentially exculpatory um, Unquote, stand under young blood, Avery has also failed to establish that the bone fragments were potentially exculpatory. A criminal defendant must show bad faith on the part of the when the state fails to preserve evidence, quote, of which no more can be said than that it could have been subjected to tests, the results of which might have exonerated the defendant, unquote. State v. Greenwald. Absent such a showing, there is no due process violation. Avery has not established any potential usefulness of further testing of the evidence found in the quarry. At trial, defense counsel made use of the state's inability to discern whether the fragments recovered from the quarry were human. Avery does not argue how a definitive determination of the fragments were human is material. There is no discussion of how or why these remains being found to be human would support a claim that Avery was not the killer. There are no asserted facts establishing how, if the quarry bone fragments are human, that Avery would have had a viable third-party suspect offense under the rules of State v. Denny. And will there is no analysis of motive, opportunity, or direct connection to the crime related to these fragments. Avery offers no fact or analysis demonstrating why it's not possible that Avery himself or his convicted accomplice, Brendan Dad, placed the bones in the quarry to divert attention from himself and escape detection. Avery fails to tell us how a possible third location of Hallbox remains possesses any exculpatory value. Even if Avery could establish that the bone fragments were potentially exculpatory, which he has, he failed to establish that the state acted in bad faith. 
a defendant can prove bad faith, quote, only if one, the officers were aware of the potential exculpatory value or usefulness of the evidence they failed to preserve, and two, the officers acted with official animus or made a conscious effort to suppress exculpatory evidence, unquote. State B. Ludke. Avery established neither. The, the state released some, but not all, of the bone fragments on September 20th, 2011. By that time, this court had issued a decision denying Avery's request for a new trial. The bone fragments were not part of Avery's direct appeal. State v. Avery. There was no pretrial request made by trial counsel, and there was no request by appellate counsel during direct appeal to examine any of the bone fragments at issue, the state made reasonable efforts to determine the identity of the bone fragments at issue when it sent the items to the FBI. The FBI could not test the items. When these items were released, to the state did not know their origin. The state did preserve the bone fragments clearly identified as the remains of Teresa Halbach and those that could be identified as being female human bone. Under these circumstances, there is no bad. Avery is due no relief. Roman numeral six, this court lacks jurisdiction to review Avery's motion to compel discovery. Avery complains that the circuit court, quote, never ruled on his motion to compel discovery he filed on July 3, 2018. He doesn't actually make any argument or claim related to it, though. It appears to just be a lament that it is unresolved. Regardless what argument Avery meant to make about this motion, this court lacks jurisdiction to review it. Motions seeking post-conviction discovery under State Bill O'Brien are considered Section 97406 motions pursuant to Kletzian, meaning Avery's motion to compel discovery of the state's 2018 examination of the DASI computer was a new action in the circuit court. Quote, an appellate court has no jurisdiction to review the denial of a post-conviction motion if there is no final written denying that motion on file in the office of the clerk. State B. Malone. Avery never received or requested a final or order denying this motion. No written order was entered, as required, to bring it before this court pursuant to Wisconsin Statute 80831. This court lacks jurisdiction to review our arguments about this. Conclusion. Though Avery raised a litany of claims in his motions, none of them entitle him to a hearing. The circuit court properly exercised its discretion to deny his motions. This court should affirm the circuit court. Dated this 27th day of May, 2020. Respectfully submitted, Joshua L. Call, Attorney General of Wisconsin, Lisa E. F. Comfer, Assistant Attorney General, State Bar Number 1009970, Attorneys for Plaintiff Respondent, Wisconsin Department. The end. Welcome to the Foul Play YouTube channel. This is Powder Puff Special Edition Reading of the State's Response Part 3. So we heard Suzanne um, finish reading the state's response, and we want to kind of open this up to discussion, you know, of what everybody's just heard. So who wants to go first? We have probably about 15 people here. <laughs> okay. By the way, you're welcome to jump in anytime. I've unrolled my eyelids from the... <laughs> multiple times that I did roll my eyes at some of the stuff you said. It's just, there's so much stuff. 
I guess the number one thing I'll jump on is the CD, the Belly CD. And his uh, explanation, it, it's, it all sounds really, really nice and it, it kind of makes sense. The defense did have the seven DVDs that were from the hard drive that got ghosted. So they did have that. Uh, however, he does leave out a lot of uh, different things here. Number one, they had that information for uh, seven months before they gave it to the defense. And he did, he, just, he did talk about discovery and it being turned over to the defense. And I believe that the statute actually reads that discovery is supposed to be turned over in a timely fashion. Now, if you can call seven months on this particular thing timely, uh, I don't. But maybe some people do, but I don't. I disagree. The second thing is... There's also this missing 2,400-page report that Belly also produced. To my knowledge, it's, I've never, I don't know where it's at. I still don't know where it's at. Uh, the CD itself, I've covered this before. It was given back in a return of evidence uh, from the DASI computer. Um, the this C, this CD was handed off to Fassbender. Now, this is just from what I can gather from the uh, the documentation that we do have, Fassbender kept the CD and the 2,400-page report sometime after trial or between uh, December of 2006 and June of 2007. He gives that CD to Wiegert. Wiegert enters it into evidence. So now my guess my real question is, uh, for anybody that wants to think about it, I actually just posted this on Twitter a few minutes ago. If that Bailey CD was work product, as he's he's really alleging that's what it is, that the defense had no right to that CD. That's what he said. Then how did why did Fassbender have it, and why did it end up in evidence? And even beyond that, why did they send it to uh, Zellner in 2018 if they had no right to it at all? That work product is off limits. So that's number one. Number two is the bones, and <laughs> I have to laugh. At the, this is really big to me. You know what? I'm going to leave the bones for later. I'm going to shut up now. Let other people talk. I totally agree with you on, you know, the stuff with the CD and everything there is so contrived. The way everything went down and how the release came out in in the end. But as far as all of this, this last little bit of the reading of the response, I don't know how very often I heard them say, although, you know, they were, they, they basically rectified the fact that this didn't even, they were like, this does not in any way take part in proving that this was Teresa Hallback in convicting Stephen Avery. It's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Um, those were biological. There was a document that Stephen Avery had signed stating not to get rid of any biological evidence whatsoever. And they violated that. They did not get his permission. They did not ask him. And to the best of my knowledge, they were supposed to. I don't know what that statute is. I want to say it's, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, 968.205, maybe? Does that sound right? I'm not, I am not very well versed on the statutes for that. I will tell you this that my understanding is they have to keep that indefinitely and it is not in any way exhausting the law enforcement or department of justice to keep biological evidence which well, is what they very clearly stated if, if it was such a big burden to them you know we gave back uh they said they gave back i don't know whatever bones they don't really know what they are the hall box to bury uh, we've uh, belabored this point a million times 
and it's uh, it, it, it's really macabre to me that to think that they would that these state officials, as much as I dislike many of them for what they've done, would be so crass that they would hand off whatever chicken bones, goat bones, uh, whatever to the hall box to bury as their daughter Teresa. Can you imagine? And why he would write it? But if well, it keeps being mentioned. It keeps being mentioned that okay, when this was done, that you you know it albeit wasn't done by you know the professionals themselves, but that they used the document um, that was written out the report written out by Eisenberg as to what they were giving away. But do you see anywhere where they have listed exactly which ones were given and which ones were not? Or if there's anything left at all? Because that keeps getting um, totally, completely skipped. Uh, Eisenberg's report, as I recall, what Hawkins wrote in his report is that um, uh, Fallon and gone and the gang they went through went in conjunction with what Eisenberg's report and shows those bones that were marked as human that's what i recall without having it right in front of me and gave those back uh, to the so what i'm gang. asking is is the there still some left in evidence well at least there's they, they said that uh, they said there is You know, there's been some, I, I, yeah, there has been some back and forth about that. And I was thinking that there was some, but to me, that's, that's not satisfactory. They're not supposed to give any of them back. Uh, so uh, I understand it. Uh, Mr. Williams, when he misdialed Kathleen Zellner's number, made a point of um, common sense at Tom Fallon that they needed to go and have a look. In the, check, check the in, in, in the evidence stores, yes, to see just what it was exactly that they still had hold of. And uh, the, the problem that I've got with that is that I understood it not so much to be the bloodstains and the swabs. I understood the court order at the time of the trial to be that all biological evidence mm -hmm. was to be uh, maintained and withheld um, for future testing. Now, if if they're trying to argue that um, certain aspects of the evidence were um, included in that order and certain elements of the evidence weren't, then I would have to argue that that's not correct. Um, I, I'm I'm not sure. I'd have to. Does anyone have an idea as to the um, to the actual wording that? Judge Willis gave in his order for the preservation of the evidence. The blood, the blood evidence was supposed to be uh, held um, specifically for future testing. You know, as technology advanced. However, there should never have to be an order written to hold this other biological evidence because uh, it's already on the books. It's already, it right, already yes. a, it's already a statute. So he didn't have to say hold this evidence. In a, in right, that, because if that's what Josh mm, is saying, I think he's wrong. Because Tom Fallon was actually part of the um, author of that piece of legislation. I understand. Gone. gone. Oh, gone. was it gone? I, th I, I have, I've always believed it to be Fallon, but there you are. Yeah. So they knew. They're aware of it anyway. You know. And either way, because Mr. Garn was instrumental in drafting of that piece of legislation, he should have known better than to be going giving it back to anybody. So it might suggest to me that uh, in light of their knowledge of that legislation, in light of the knowledge of the order that was made by Willis, they've gone and given that evidence back out of spite, probably to deprive Avery any opportunity of testing. Now, you've got to ask yourself, if that's the case, why? Why would they, why would they be trying to prevent the retesting of that in an independent lab? That's right. There should right. Be, there should be no fear. And you know, again, I brought this up last week. I think who initiated contact? Who called who? That's a very good question. I have to believe yes. that. I have to believe that the state called them. 
Yeah, because if the family who were present throughout the trial, you know, I'm sure that they would have been well aware of the stipulation for the preservation of the evidence. They, they would have known that it would have been pointless going to the state and asking for the remains. They would have right. received instruction from the prosecution or from the state. I'm sorry, Mrs. Holbeck, we can't, we, we can't um, return those remains because a court order has been made. So they would have had to have lived with that. So I've got to believe that it was the state who said, OK, look, you've got this stuff. We can let you have it. You can move on with your lives and do whatever. So I think it was the state who initiated the contact there. There's no explanation they could possibly give that would justify them giving those bones away, period. Of course not. Of course not. But to add to that, Sammy, to say that they're not human or they don't really know what they yeah. are. They, they just... We just gave them something back and lieu to yeah well we had kfc for lunch and the bin was full up so we just thought we'd kind of you know right. two birds with one stone exactly. get rid of the rubbish and close a book on the close a book on this on the subject for good nobody in their right mind nobody in their right mind would ever you have to be I, I, there's no way in this world I'm giving away any kind of biological evidence that's supposed to be held on to till the day that Stephen Avery either dies or is released. It's okay yeah. because it's not. Of course it's not. Absolutely This not. is getting overlooked and it's this right here in and of itself is a big factor in why he should have a new supposed, hearing yeah they're supposed to be the gatekeepers to the law if they're holding that position with any integrity what you don't do is then go against your own state's legislation and the trial judge's ruling as to the preservation of the evidence you're aware of the rules you're aware of the legislation you were part of the trial you were part of the um group responsible for the drafting of the legislation so you should you know you then to go and give that evidence back is an actual crime so as gatekeeper yes. to the law you know you you, you Who's can't put have, them in check for that you can't have a foot in both camps can you you can't no. be one foot on the side of law enforcement and one foot on the side of breaking the laws that you wrote well they're charged with enforcing Sure. Enforcing it, not breaking it. Right. I would like to know, though, where's the accountability and where's the oversight and who would make, you know, make them accountable for that? Law it's so far in all of this. Yeah. Law, mm. law enforcement and states prosecutors. Um, ish. If they if they are the people who are supposed to be dispensing the justice, and they break the law, who is responsible for the dispensing the justice to them? Who prosecutes? And I would love to know the thoughts of people running the Innocence Project on that this tail end of the response of how they, you know, the, how they worded everything as if. We, yeah, we gave the bones away. So what? Well, that's a piss poor attitude, really, isn't it? They're saying we... it's not a constitutional right um, to expect them to have that at his disposal. Well, I'm telling you, this is part of the appeals process. This is something that he, sh he should, he has a right to. Yeah. Now, it would appear to the lay, the lay observer from outside of the United States that uh, it's actually not a constitutional right in Wisconsin to be innocent, you know, because right. they're going to, they, that's just the way it looks to the casual observer. So mm -hmm. you've got to ask who, who's policing the police. That's why something is in order to ensure that they know they're supposed to keep that stuff to make sure that they do. Because there are appeals processes to go through and 
when things advance, where biological testing can be done on something that previously, like DNA and blood and all that, is all being worked on and coming That's, into advancements can be used, that they should be able to apply that to this biological evidence. And would it, they have totally, completely screwed him out of that. Yes, they have. Now, um, I understand that Patrick Willis, in his um, ruling on the evidence, stated that Avery was free at any time without order of the court to test that evidence. So why is he being made to jump through hoops and having to come up with a valid reason that they will accept? Because well, already made the well, ruling. Willis's order was for the blood evidence. Ah, oh, oh, okay. That's what I'm saying. Uh, yeah, and so they're splitting hairs over the bone evidence. Right. I mean, that was already a statute, so there was absolutely... No reason at all Willis should ever have to have written a, anything in order at all about advancements, uh, you know, and in testing for that. It's already there. So, because there was, there would really be no reason for the stat, but because if I'm rem remembering right, this was, this was one of the reasons that uh, the Wisconsin legislature, which gone was part of that whole process, put the, wrote that uh, statute to begin with because of advancements. In technology yeah yeah modern 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 science was beginning to catch up with sure. kind of the, the backward ways of voice constant and they actually recognized that they needed to bring themselves into the 20th century at some point so however late it was they did that and even though they did that they still went and broke they still Sean. yeah we, we well you know it's, it's, for Wisconsin, it's still the 20th century. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it, it just it defies belief, really, that they can write the rules and set the laws and then go and break them and explain to the rest of the world, well, it's okay for us to go and break them so, no, so long as nobody else does. Well, that puts them above the law, and that is completely unacceptable. In any in any person's eyes, that's got to be wrong. You know, it's uh, something else I found uh, quite uh, interesting listening to because um, I I had the you know the enjoyment of of listening to Susan read through this these three parts. How many times did Josh Call say procedural bar? How many times? I lost oh, count. Count. It was consistently throughout. <laughs> I lost count. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that was unbelievable the amount of times that they said procedural barred. It was like every time, every word that I heard was, oh, but that's procedurally barred. But that's procedurally barred. No, you can't say that because it's procedurally barred. Well, you so know, often, you know, think, it's just, if you think about it, if it was um, procedurally barred, I mean, to me, if it was that much against it, why would it? And he just basically turn in a couple of sheets and outline just a few things to say this entire thing is procedurally barred. Thank you. He didn't do that though. Let me let me let me get a little skippy here with some. To me, this entire response was pure evil, <laughs> and delves into a little bit of the dark arts, if you ask me. There are specific things that are mentioned in there uh, so very often that only thing that an individual could walk away with is procedurally barred, impounded into their, embedded into their brain, number one. Number two, there's so much garbage thrown in there, you forget all the rest. It's all word craft. And in yes. my view, yes. in the, na the nature of the word craft, is in an attempt to put down in writing a method of justifying their wrongdoing and blaming right. Avery and using Avery to, and blaming Stephen Avery for it. Yes, I just had to go there. I'm sorry, but I did because oh, I'm sorry. I am very I'm analytical when it comes to wording um, and. You know what things are spouted out of someone 
I am very analytical on that <clears throat> to the point of many of my colleagues here, people that are working with me on this team have tolerated me beyond belief because of my, I take things so quite literally, but it goes way beyond that for me well, in, I, in this, in this right, reading. But, but, yes. But, think about it, Sammy. Uh, words in the legal world are power. That's what they are. That's right, yep. Jake. That's right. That's exactly right. And what you also need to understand is that when you're constructing um, the, con the, the consent of a legal brief, you need to say exactly what you mean. Skirting around an issue, using obfuscating language and terminology that kind of clouds the issue just a way in my mind of confusing the issue and trying to hide the truth you right. see, you, exactly. which is it's crucial it is absolutely imperative that these legal briefs are read very carefully they need to be understood the way they are being written yep. and it's you know you've got to pull that apart on that basis there's some crud in there that they have cited so, so many different things that some of them actually do not apply. And it only sounds like it does because it sounds really good. It sounds like they know what they're talking about, but it's all obfuscation. It is all, it's like the smoke and mirrors. It's manipulation. And he, he did it very yes. well. Oh, yeah. Unfortunately, and, and how they basically said what's on those CDs is really no big deal. It's kind of what I got out of that. It kind of bothered me because they only mentioned the very least of it. And it is so much worse than any of that. That's very bothersome to me because that for sure had that been found on anything Stephen touched he it would have been one of the number one things used to nail him yeah they actually say that um uh, i lost my train of thought i'm sorry oh, talking about the cd go ahead think, you'll think of it yeah oh it's just man, I, I do remember it they actually say that it would not have changed the outcome of the trial. Yeah. I mean, that's just ridiculous. Well, it would have changed the outcome of the trial. If, yeah. If, if Beauty and String had that. Yeah. And it, it, might, just... it might not have changed the outcome of the trial, but it certainly would have given the jury another line of thought which they didn't have because of the fact that it wasn't raised. Now, I can't think of a murder trial in the last 30 years where sexual pornography or the viewing of pornography or one person's proclivity to possess that kind of pornography has not been an issue. Whether they were the suspect and the defendant in a trial or not, it will always raise an eyebrow with the police. And so for the police to turn around and say, oh, well, we are aware of the pornography, but we didn't see that as anything that was specifically needed looking into. Why would we? You know, well, there are textbooks written on the subject. That's why they should have looked into it. It's pretty serious, reasonable. I mean... Look how many uh, truthers, uh, sleuthers that um, really think it's, you know, Bobby could possibly be <coughs> responsible because of Bobby cannot be overlooked. I'm not saying that I suspect him. I'm not because Ryan is my favorite. Uh, the very fact that. Bobby had such disturbing content on his computer, and it must have been Bobby that was viewing that, that material. It would certainly, if I was had any part of the investigation, it would have given me serious cause for concern. 
I honestly don't think uh, Bobby had anything to do with it, but uh, sitting on a job and hearing about those searches, that's going to change my attitude a little bit. You know, in much, they, much of this, they will cite cases that were cited through Supreme Courts um, that are in other states. And the fact of the matter is, there's several people in this whole thing that should have been investigated <clears throat> that had more than, more than a little implication of suspicion in the direction of in any any given individual in any other state would have been considered as suspects well i think they wouldn't have so much needed to have been implicated in any way at all really but certainly in the united kingdom and in the majority of europe it would have been a huge red flag to law enforcement and it would have given them a, a line of inquiry they would have had to have exhausted before they could have ruled that person out. In in Bobby's case, in Scott's case, in Ryan's case, none of that was done. And I would need to question myself, why wasn't it done? The only reason I can think of why it wasn't done is because they were either trying to avoid bringing that person in as a suspect, or they simply weren't interested. Well, you want to talk about, for instance, um, they were making basically the statement that uh, that day planner, there's no proof that's what came out of, of Hallback's car. Um, when the truth of the matter is, there was stuff written on there that was said to only have been written on that day on her way and onto these appointments because there were phone calls made and taken down information. And she even so far as said to someone on the phone, I have, I have to pull over and write this down in my day planner. And for those things to be written on that, not be in the system, she could not back in those days be in the system, uh, updating a online book while she's on the road. Mean them wrong. So they're saying, oh, well, there's no proof of that. You know, that almost like he could have just printed that out from online. Who knows? But they're totally, completely going, no, don't look over here. Look over here. Well, in my view, yeah. the state, I have, I don't believe, I give no credit uh, whatsoever to any of the evidence provided by the state, in my view. The witnesses could all have been manipulated emotionally to have given um, evidence or statements in a way that favoured the prosecution. I don't trust any of their scientific studies. I don't trust any of their um, wider inquiries with the zipperers, with the redants, with anybody. None of it. I don't trust a single piece of evidence. Because once you find that, it's, I was I was sold on the on the defence the moment Anitowoc stepped foot on the yard following the discovery of the van. Once they'd uh -huh. been removed from the case, they should have been removed from the case. Full stop. They had no need to be anywhere near the investigation as advisors as assistants or as observers in any way. They were a professional do, law do, enforcement do, do, agency. You, they didn't need any advice. They didn't need to give any advice. All they needed to do was stay, to well, clear, was stay well clear of it, which they didn't, which for me would suggest that the investigation isn't worth the paper it's put on. Oh, yeah. I totally agree with that we're looking at they're saying uh he cannot add this person or this person or have this suspect who there are things about each of these individuals that in any other state red flag that would say this has to be investigated this person must be investigated and looked at and that was not done here and absolutely him having that day planner, 
that was a big red flag for me. Oh, well, I mean, Thank it's not just first one. It's not just Ryan. Um, I mean, uh, who is it? I think it might have been Dederin or the other guy. Um, the day they found the vehicle, the the radio traffic was: Do we have Avery in custody yet? I mean, there hasn't even been an it investigation. Was Jack, it was Jack. No, right? They, they hasn't even been an investigation. So why would they be if if that isn't evidence of tunnel vision or of a yeah. previous of a previous plan or a previous agenda? I don't know what exactly. is. Exactly. Yeah, because with that, were they not asking about a body and that sort of say, but is there a body and they're like, yeah. no, do no, we, is do we have to see it? Have we like? found no do we have avery in custody i don't mm -hmm. think so well why are you even asking those questions before anybody's even opened an inquiry yeah because you're automatically I, assuming and you're assuming that avery's guilty and in uh, you know there's the famous quote assumption is the mother of all fuck-ups <laughs> absolutely it's an absolute dead giveaway yeah, Lee it's just plan. it's red flag isn't a word. I don't think he was assuming anything. I think he knew that Avery was getting set up. Right. Well, you uh, know, you why why was Avery the first name in his head? I'm uh, sure there must have been yeah. other people in the eighteen years Avery was away. There must have been other viable candidates who they knew about would be more suitable to have. I mean, more as a as a suspect for that kind of crime than Avery. Oh my God! Avery's There's been, so many. <laughs> Avery's Avery's been proven innocent once. You know he isn't he isn't a sex offender. He isn't a registered sex offender because he's just been exonerated. So why would you be looking at him? Why would you even suspect him? Just because yeah. the vehicle was found on his property. I'll tell you why. Because by going after him. You're killing the lawsuit. And that's the whole idea of the exercise. That's right. I Undoubtedly. 1,000% agree. Something was going to happen. I if, it, if it hadn't been for uh, Teresa, it would have been something else that would have derailed. Because what did, what did they arrest him for? Possession S-Jax. S-Jax. They, oh. they, something was happened. Charge. That's right. Yeah. And, and, I just have to say, there is no part of this that is actually an investigation. There's just no investigation, and they're never in. The investigation was never intended. And they didn't look at anybody else because they only wanted Stephen Avery. So, and it all goes back to you know the whole thing that they knew that from the very beginning that it was going to be Stephen Avery, and they knew that they could do certain things and get away with it because the world was never going to be looking like it is now, and yet we are. And so that's uh, you know, red flags and you know, proper or improper investigation to me means nothing because this was the intent, well, I believe, yeah. all along. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's not just that. It's the fact that he was the so-called genius that he managed to clean up a whole murder scene without any evidence in the house and the garage and everything like that but he was daft enough to put burn bones in his burn pit and burn her in his backyard and then go and scatter some mere bones in the quarry and leave a car on his property it's, it's crazy it's absolutely crazy Idiots. I mean, there's just no expectation even, that it was going to be that 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 it, it was no expectation that it was going to be looked at any further than those that year let's just no. say that Stephen period. Avery Stephen just Avery was viewed by everybody in managed work as white trash they were viewed as scum of the earth and they would there was they didn't believe that the Averys would be able to get the money together well that's to how they treated all of them sean they treated, they treated yeah, the entire they, they say, Avery family that way. entire family yep so yeah that's that's been my argument the whole time is that just it never yeah it does go back to money and i'm telling you they know they were crap in their pants and when when kathleen zellner came on the scene 
I think that's when they automatically all started going into like, okay, we got, and going back to the very beginning of this, of this conversation, I was wanting to say, you guys were talking about who was it that made the call, you know, did the state call or did, did they call the state? I would speculate that the state are the ones who made that call uh, to start with because they, what they were saying, oh shit. Some, we need you guys need to get rid of this because we know that there's going to be appeals coming beyond just the regular appeals that you know had already been when when out Kathleen Zellner came in they knew they had to get rid of some stuff well, Sean's just right. knew it the hall box would have been that, told he's right they would have been told after trial probably even before trial this biological evidence cannot leave custody of the state I'm sorry because it was a it was it was already in legislation and it had already been passed oh, in the statute. Years, years so it, it, it would have been the the, the uh, DOJ's responsibility to advise the family to the situation with regards to the biological remains. And so compliance rules, which would have existed during the day, find a piece of paper saying that they'd been advised as to that and that they understood the next, so, well, you know. I don't want to go too far on Kev a limb and, and, and be accusatory to say that that's exactly what happened, but I have to believe that the hall box did not initiate that contact because, number one, there's a couple of different reasons, but here we are. Is this kind of a, as far as I know, there was nothing going on. It wasn't her birthday um, or anything else. It was just... Here we are in September of 2011, and let's have this uh, bone giveaway. I, re I refuse okay, that, to believe okay. that the family had. I refuse that the family had any sentimentality towards. I think that they might have even considered Trey's problem well well gotten rid of. So in that respect, I don't think that they would have gone anywhere near the DOJ asking for a return of the remains. I don't think they were that bothered. I really, I really don't think they cared very much. So in, you have to wonder why would DOJ, in light of their knowledge of the legislation and the court order at the time of trial, why would they be looking to get rid of that evidence? Because they believed that Stephen Avery's appeals uh, system, his opportunities at appeal, would run their course. They thought it was a done and dusted issue. They thought it would never arise again. They thought that they would be in the clear to get rid of the info, the, 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 the uh, material that could potentially backfire and bite them in the butt. So, which is why. I'm wondering, I, I'm i really bad with timelines, from the, between the time that the hall box dropped the civil suit and the time that the bones were given to them, what, it, it, like, were those things, those dates about a near year. each other? I think, it, yeah, I think it was about a year. Bones were returned in 2011, and I believe that the, civil, the whole back civil suit was discontinued in 2010, I think. Willis, Willis, yeah, Willis retired in 2010 and was succeeded by Sukovitz. And Sukovitz did try to hold on to the civil litigation on behalf of the Hallbacks. Okay. Uh, eventually, she had to she had to concede and let it slide. They dropped the case. So, they withdrew. Yeah. That's they, my uh, question. Uh, what do those two things? have a relationship them dropping the civil suit case and the bones being given away is no. there a relationship there 2000, okay 2013 or 14 i think okay Maybe somebody else can correct me There's... no i think i think they dropped the civil suit long before then mm, okay that's no, what i wondered i, I didn't know I so. I'll, I'll, I'll have to yeah we'll have to i'll have to check that 10, we'll have to check 10, that. 10, 10, 10. Hi. do you remember was it 2013 that the that the uh, hall box withdrew their civil suit. I remember my memory's horrible. I'm sorry, guys. Okay, well then, can somebody tell me why? Because I've never been able to find it myself. The reason why? I mean, who? 
why did they drop that civil suit? Is uh, there's a reason, and I just don't know what it is. I think it was viewed. I think it was viewed by the family as being unrealistic that they'd get anything out of it. So they may have considered that it wasn't worth the stress of okay. trying to get blood out of a stone. All right, I'm just going down rabbit holes probably. So I've just always been curious about those those dates. So well, these are curious, but no, it, because uh, you know if we look at number one, you know they immediately tried to sue Avery when he got his settlement. You know, and they paid off. Uh, Glenn and Kelly got. The 160 grand and then the retainer went to uh string and beauty as, mm. as his defense because he couldn't have a public defender anymore he had that money so they tried to go after it and you know it, even at the time they were like uh no you can't really do that yeah well i think there's an awful lot i think there's more than meets the eye to the situation between ben and kelly advising steve to take the money I don't know why, but I've always been a little bit suspect of Buting and Strang, and I've always been a little bit suspect of Kelly or, or um, what's his name? Oh, oh, Steve Walt, Glenn. Walt, Walt Kelly. And yeah, that's Steve him. Glenn. Steve Glenn and the other guy. Yeah, Walt that's Kelly. him. Yeah. 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 Uh, don't know why, but I've always been. Uh, there's something about them, Jack. And it just they're you know, a bit well, too. You, well, you know the Glenn and. Glenn and Kelly were uh, defense attorneys years and years yeah. prior, right? Yeah. And they turned to civil. Well, they were fighting. I understand that they were actually fighting a civil suit for him, weren't they? They were his representatives in a civil suit. Yes. And if the I'm not that, mistaken, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. They're the ones that suggested uh, beauty and strain, which, you know, I fought them, you know, I fought the, them for you know, and numerous things, especially after the Kratz press conference. And they really kind of should have known the level that he would, this guy would go and this trust factor of not trusting anything that he did at all. I, I am bothered by that. But as far as anything beyond other than, I, I have a difficult time. I, I just cannot believe that they would be in any shape or form um would sell Stephen out I, I, I just can't see it i, I haven't see they it. were scared they weren't going to get anything with the new charges i i felt like with Stephen and, it, uh, uh, i've never met a lawyer who's done something for nothing i love they right if they they will not act until they are absolutely certain that they will get paid right I think that's why uh, they they advised him to to settle that lawsuit because they wanted to get something, needed to get something, and they knew once Stephen was convicted, that lawsuit was going to go go away, which it did, yeah. and yeah. that they were going to get nothing. And so they're like, yeah. oh yeah, it wasn't in Stephen's best interest; it was in their best interest. They needed some money in their pocket before it all went to hell. And they used the money to be able to pay for a decent defense. It's justification for accepting the offer. Yeah. Now, I, I, there's nothing and nobody on either side that is uh, above suspicion for one way or another to one degree or another. Everybody's got their hand in it for one reason, and it's usually it's for themselves, honestly, yeah. I believe. Well, they are, don't, they're certainly not out of, they're, they're certainly not out for Stephen. No, they're I not. I, 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 oh. What was the other oh, part of it? What was the other part of this? Uh, part three, we've covered a little bit of the, of the CD and we've covered quite a bit of the bones. How that? about the, yeah. the, the keeping of the, you know, what they say, of, you know, that preservation thing. I mean, um, when they were talking about what they took from the RAV, do you think that they were trying to cover their butt that they don't have the RAV and they only have parts of it? I don't think they have any of that RAV. I think it is long gone. I think it's possible it's gone. I mean, I, I don't know, but I think it's very possible. Because it, it yeah, because there's that. Is it me or, or was that very minuscule, their mentioning of the yeah. RAV? Yeah, yeah. That's well, what it is. Yeah. Kind of, you know, slightly 
put in there and just kind of real fast breeze right walk past. away from it. Yes, exactly. If yeah. they've if they've got the brass neck to have disposed of those bones in light of their legislation, never mind the court order, court order only applied to the van. The legislation applies to the van. So my view is if they got rid of something as vital as the bones getting rid of the van would have been an afterthought you know oh well why don't you just empty the container and get rid of that old rav while you're at it kind hard, of thing yeah, you know? hard, hard to argue against that sean <laughs> you know, yeah. i'm so i'm so look, I'm, I'm a i'm a former criminal I feel. and i i i i can see a wrong one in cut yeah. in the, under color of law from a mile away yeah, you know what I mean. I, I, because I, I, I consider myself to have had the benefit of the experience, having been an opponent of law enforcement for so many years. I've learned their tricks. I've learned their kind of wily ways, if you like. And I don't trust one of them. It's unfortunate too, because there's some, there's actually some really good law enforcement officers out there. Majority. That- the majority to, are they, good. Yeah, they, they yeah. want to do the right thing, and they will do the right thing. There are more good than bad. Yeah. But what what upsets me about the good guys is that sometimes they feel obliged to support the bad, so that they don't get looked upon as or being it, outsiders. Or at because once they, you they, get just, that, they just look the other way and don't say anything. Yeah, they, I was just gonna to, say they just look the other. Way. They just look the other way, and yeah. I don't like that at all. And so that well you, that. In my view, it makes them as guilty as the guilty. I'm sorry, sure. because they're supposed to they're supposed to act when they see wrongdoing. You can't you can't act when you see a civilian doing wrong, and not act when you see a colleague doing wrong, because that colleague doing wrong will do you more what harm are they, what are they than that it? criminal. What, what do they call us, Sean? If we see something, we're an accomplice. If we don't, yes, stop. accomplice after the fact. Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Sammy used a really uh, nice word. You and uh, Sammy and Sean were talking kind of back in the beginning. And as I was listening to the reading, I you, uh, back, you were talking about eyes rolling in the back of your head because I got that place to that place because Sammy's word was really pretty and attractive. But my words were it, it, there was so much word vomit in there to bury some of those things that like the rab and you know getting into too much detail so there was just all of these other things that were really nonsensical and my mind kind of like intuitive in, in a way you know and i just just i just was like word bomb it to cover up you know stuff that was really could have done something to be beneficial and helpful to Stephen, but I couldn't allow it and so they just had to keep covering it up with the uh, I, I just heard a lot of other I mean, what, I'm, what I really meant was he said a lot of things that that made me roll my eyes at him. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. Eye rolling. Gotcha. OK. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, yeah. Yeah. I just think this whole the whole thing is a bunch of crap. Honestly, let's just say it like it is, because they're just talking about procedure, procedure, procedure. They're not really facing any of her merits at all. They're Eight just points. throwing them under the bus. Like they mean nothing. Like she's some kind of newbie at this game and she's, mm-hmm. she has no idea what she's talking about. And they're, to me, it was like a slap in the face. That's exactly how I feel about it. Whole brief has been that uh, the whole response has been that way or a slap in the face, you know, trying to make her. Yeah. Look like she doesn't. Have it, was it. More like like, it was more like yeah. a dictation than a response. Yeah. I, yeah, like she like she that needs schooling or something, you know. I mean, come on, look at the real merits she has. Look at it through you're supposed to have clear justice eyes. You want to see the truth, you know? Well, look at that. It's I mean, you're just avoiding it. Did you notice the that fact her- that they're trying to point out that she never that, that, that there's no Brady violations in there whatsoever? So basically what they're saying is is Kathleen Zell, no, you've not got a fucking clue what you're talking about. That's the right. way I took it. Exactly. Yeah. Well, the, 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 he basically said that, you know, pretty much everything Kratz did at trial was just great. And everything that Kathleen uh, has presented is procedurally barred, piecemeal, or it doesn't count and she can't do it. Nah, 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 nah. 
that's what I think. Procedure. That's exactly how I felt, Jax. Yeah, uh, procedure. Out, oh, well, you should have, if, if you'd have done it then, then you yeah. might have been able to do it. So no, no, well, no, 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 no. Okay, well, now if you remember, <laughs> how could she have done it then? They had an agreement that they were going to let her have things. And in fact, it was the RAV, if I'm not um, am I right about that? It was the rev, wasn't it? Or the bones, the testing of the bones. Well, and they were going to work it out. That, 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 yeah. that started right off the bat with Fallon. And of course, we, yeah. right. we talked about that whole charade. It was a setup. <laughs> Complete setup. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if you look at that and then you look at what they're saying now, I mean, it, of course it was piecemeal, some of it. I mean, it had to be. So another that's thing, just ridiculous. Another thing he said, he was talking about. Uh, what uh, the, the prosecutor had handed over to him and that the fact that Beating and Strang basically trusted what he handed over. Well, why wouldn't he? Why wouldn't they trust him? They're supposed to, right? They're oh, supposed to work together. That was another question I had, um, if you guys had seen it this way or heard it this way. When they were talking about, you know, you know, slapping her across the face because, you know, you had two months and... Uh, what was the um Vili, he did it in 10 days so you guys should have been able to do it you know in the whole, in the two months or but Vili only had that one thing that Vili was working on he was only looking at the at it the was they said he did it in 16. It, they it said it was marked it brendan's right where but where but where they're you know we're talking about the defense they're not looking at just one thing they have cds and they have the blood and they have the us and they have, they have okay, everything that they're trying to get at. right how about marking no. it right they put it as brendan's cd so they there was nothing oh. there that's what they told right. them so they lied to and, the defense and all of that is and all of that aside they're not gonna you know obviously the their the response isn't telling us that of course we know it but yeah they just wanted to um it, well you know what he had he did it in this amount of time and you had this much more time so you should have been able to do it well i argue that point because defense didn't have just that one thing that they were trying to get information from the cds they had those cds and they had so many other things and i don't know why these attorneys who you know who were highly recommended apparently were so willing to just so like oh okay you say there's nothing there then you know we won't look why why would oh. why would you do that that's oh, that no makes way no to sense to me it. that is oh. no way to conduct a, that is no way to conduct an effective defense on a murder on a murder charge that is an absolute joke so that that's yeah. insufficient yeah. counsel and they, sufficient and counsel and and they were supposed to be the top two lawyers, according I, to, to Stephen Glenn. They were the best of the best. Well, I'm very sorry, but if that's their best, my advice is do not get arrested in Wisconsin. And don't hire those guys if you do. Because I, <laughs> and don't I hire just, those guys. I just Can I jump in here real like quick? Uh, sorry. Oh, yeah. I am. Go ahead. I, I, I looked up and back to the civil suit, it was postponed in 2013, dismissed June right. 2015. Right, thank you. No okay, problem. so there was no, nothing, nothing to see there. <laughs> okay, thank you. I, I couldn't remember anything. Uh, I uh, actually found one of your, one of your comments on Reddit, j Jack. <laughs> I, made, I made a few. Oh, no. I know they got rid of the bones in 2011 whilst um, the Hagopian, was it Hagopian? The yes. Hagopian appeal was going forward. Now, it would, it would, it defies belief that they would do that, you know, that they would, that, that they would return those bones during an appeal where it might be possible that those bones would be called into question. So well, I think that's I would suggest. Timing. I would suggest that the exercise of getting rid of the bones was a housekeeping measure. Yeah. Do you, can I, damage, I know you guys, a, I'm sorry, go ahead. A then. damage limitation exercise to restrict any kind of liability that could have come back against the state. It was all about cleaning house, getting rid of anything that could have cast a shadow. I agree. But yeah, I, I know you guys 
Pat and Linda. I know you guys were talking about this and I kind of lost my Wi-Fi, but um, it was brought up. How, how did they give the bones back? What did the hall box call them or did they call well, we were, we were know that? that. Yeah, we I didn't hear the answer. That. We don't know who contacted oh. who, but it is our belief at the moment. I mean, it's only speculation, but it's a strong belief that um, the hall backs would have been called by the state. The state would okay. have been the ones to have initiated that contact. Okay. All right. Thank you. So How does everybody right. like the use of of words uh, for of evidence that there are what they're considered to be and what was actually used to convict him? I noticed throughout this case that they they put each thing in its own class and that in and of itself separates it from him getting his rights um, to some of this evidence. Does anyone notice that? You know, they say this is exculpatory, this is not. Um, right, but they don't know what he's convicted on is not. They're saying, I, they're <laughs> saying that they were saying that they're not sure what was given back. They don't know what bones were human and what bones weren't. So in that regard, from a scientific point of view, you've got to ask, why would they give untested remains back to a family for a family to dispose of those remains as though they were their family member? That's what mean, I want to know. There's no That's integrity there. Adjusted. There's no integrity there whatsoever. Why would anybody in a law import in a law enforcement position even consider giving back untested remains? Because you could be giving back the remains of Carmen Bootwell for all we know, and no one would be any the wiser. Well, you can't just go doing that. You know, it's it goes against every written rule in the book. I well, hope, they did it. I hope they KZ, did it. I hope KZ rips rip them from one end of the rips them a new one you damn right yeah um, do right you know if the hobbocks would come forward and say something like well i'd like to know if these were my daughter's bones since i've been hearing these rumors i mean they are so quiet about this why don't they come forward that would really be something you know i, I mean, could have more respect for them i could have more respect for them if they were to have come forward now and say look in light of all the noise that's been yeah. created about this we are now in a situation where we need to put our own minds at rest and we need to know the score. Either yeah, okay. you right. believe that those remains were our daughters or you don't. If you do, then okay, that's fine. But if you don't, then why did you give them to us? Right. I right. mean, you know, this is just that's so because wrong. That is one of, family. It's just that wrong. Is, and they did it. And, and, and the Hobbits don't question nothing. That's one of the most unethical things for a, an, a public official to do. To do something like that is so disrespectful, not just to the family, but to the victim. And it's it, disrespectful it's just, to everybody. It's, it's a disgrace. About that. It's a disgrace. It's disrespectful to everybody. And it's an insult to the citizens of Wisconsin. Yes, I agree. I mean, come on, that could be any one of us. You got to look at it this way because it's that could not be any of us. Yeah, there, but, there, of but for, there, but for the grace of God, that could have been any of our brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers. How would we feel if we was to now find ourselves in the same position of the holbacks? How would you, I, you know? How loudly would you scream from the top of the kind of city hall in, yeah, think in, in, in Milwaukee I, I, or I, Madison? I told you what I'd do, and I, I know what my wife yeah, you, and, I'd and, be, uh, yeah. I'd be camping and the sister. I'd, yeah. I'd yeah. be camping outside. I'd be camping outside the front door of that call until I got answers. They Listen, would not be able yeah, to get rid of me. Exactly. Yeah, think you've seen my eyes lately? That's what I would be doing. I'd be pounding. I would be going crazy if the state did something like that to me. I would make the biggest loud noises. Every newspaper. I every, would. Everything. I would. 
I would be creating a problem for Wisconsin that would make Stephen Avery look pedestrian. Like, yeah, they like the would, choir boy, you got it. You know what I mean? I'd like, I would make him look like kindergarten stuff. Problems? Yep. You, you, you know, you really don't want to upset me because I will be banging on your door morning, noon and night and I will not stop until I get suitable kind of parts. Those bones of are a very Especially serious... It is a very serious uh, topic for me because there's no way on this God's green earth I would ever accept as one of my children me without either. proof, without absolute proof. Absolutely. I think it's for everybody. Thank you. I don't think any is, of us would, Sammy. And I this think, is why you I know. Was, sorry, this is what I was saying earlier. I don't accept any of the state's evidence because, in my view, they haven't proven anything, nothing. I've looked at all of their documents. I've cross-referenced it with other documents, with the statements from people, and none of it fits. None of it. None of it is incorporated. None of it is positive. None of it is proof positive. None of it. Yeah, none they of it. absolutely state that in this response, too. Yes. In respect to the bones. Yeah. Well, they're trying to cut their both. They're, they're trying to cut the mustard both ways, aren't they? You know, during the trial, uh -huh. it was oh yeah, well you know, their bones, their trees, the whole back's bones, blah blah blah. And then they go and give those bones back and say, but we don't know whose bones they were. We don't know what that they were even human. Well, you know, make your mind up. Fifteen years yes. have passed. You know, at what yeah, point that's... in those fifteen years? What point in those fifteen years did you change your mind about those bones? Yeah, and what point in those fifteen years has the whole backs no sussed anything out? You know what I mean? As as everybody says, if the, if that was meant to be my son's remains, and I'm finding out later on that the, it might not have been their bones in the first place, then I'd be banging down everybody's door. The, the 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 it with all the other words that go along with you know the outrage and how fear I think it's cruel to that what they've it's just humanity wise it's cruel what giving back something that they know <laughs> darn good and well probably are not um, you know I don't know if they know darn good and well but it's cruel to do that just to a family for grieving. When you when you hand them this bag or box of whatever and say here's your child's remains and and yeah. uh, the rest of now we all agree in here that none of us mm -hmm. would sit still for that without proof but it, you know what they've done there isn't just done it out, before. it goes against every fiber of what it takes to be a police officer it goes against the grain of law it goes against all grains when it comes to justice goes, every single it, bit of it none of them know what any one of those against, and well, it's um, inhumane it's absolutely cold-blooded and ruthless to treat the family in that way which makes me wonder since the family haven't haven't raised their voice about it were the family aware all along or was it just an act uh, which would it? lead me, which would leave me to speculate. Maybe Teresa is still alive, because I yeah, have yet to see, matter. I have yet to see proof positive of her death. Can I just chime in for a second? Sure. You can in chime in as long as you like. Uh, absolutely. In regards to returning the bones, there is some speculation and some rumor going that in two thousand and ten, the rapid DNA the NDNA was uh, established and about to be approved, um, meaning that mm. the DNA could be established as quickly as two hours in the most uh, decomposed or most uh, calcined of remains. Yes. Calcined remains, yeah. And they yes. have actually used that for the 9-11 victims. Yeah, and they have uh, not, established the uh, DNA. 
Next thing we know, no. the bones mm -hmm. are given back to the Hallbucks without any paper trail to show that mm -hmm. they have actually requested. Because you can't just uh, call up the somebody and say, hey, I want the bones back. There's got to be a paper trail. And there was no paper trail that have surfaced so far. I've been on Reddit, YouTube, we oh, asked yeah. lawyers, we asked every family, possible researcher, right? The, the family would have signed documents yes. signing those signing those remains away because yes, they were, were subjects to a court order and it would have been required by the Wisconsin Department of Justice Compliance Office for the family to have been notified of that so they would have probably have needed to sign those remains over so they over. did not and ask for them. The last what? chain of custody that we have is at the, week, uh, the Wheatling uh, funeral home that they were dropped oh, off and that's it that's where it stops Yes. I'm sorry, Dr. It's, Silkman, you wanted to say something. Oh, oh I was going to say. Oh. Yeah, no, no, no. No, thank you, guys. No, I was listening in, and uh, I just want to, first of all, commend um, Susan for <laughs> – that was a very hard read to get through because it was very, very detailed. And, uh, Wizard, you're right on the money, mate. You are right on the money. Uh, in my opinion, the Horbuck family are in cahoots. Uh, with the law enforcement, the Hallback yeah. family would have been told um, very, very early on. Now, there's two schools of thought. Uh, either Teresa faked her own death, so uh, the Hallback family had Hallbacks had nothing to worry about. They knew it was all is all part of cahoots. Uh, they were working together. If you believe that Teresa Hallback is alive, uh, because their reaction is not of a normal family, in my opinion. Something Absolutely is really, not. really weird. Um, secondly, if Teresa Hobart is indeed dead, uh, they would have been told very, very early on that their daughter was deceased. And I believe it all comes back down to um, what Bushman found at Cuss Road. So Absolutely. it depends. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, it They're depends. Here. It depends on what they found, but they would have informed the Horbucks in probably a secret meeting to say, look, we found your daughter. Uh, this is what we found. She's obviously deceased. We believe, uh, we believe that um, uh, uh, your daughter was murdered by Stephen Avery and uh, you've got nothing to worry about. We're going to make sure that um, he's found guilty. So... You know, when you when you listen to that report, it's very very obvious that uh, the state came across very very aggressively, and I've never seen a report in which whereby <laughs> any suspects are actually given um, free passage by the state, right? Even if you, supported. If you list, it, the support, correct. I've never yeah. seen. I've never seen a Protected report even. which they're saying. You know, you, it can't be. It can't be Ryan Hilligus because of the following reasons. It can't be Bobby Dassey because of the following reasons, and and so what it shows is the investigation was skewed to look at only one person from day one, and these guys have just admitted by by actually providing an exit clause to Denny suspects. I've never seen that before in my life. Not, not to get too um, far off of the Jack. track here while you're talking about Cuss Road, what do you think about tying that in with the report with the FOIA that Rookie just got and the dog handlers? Uh, you mean about finding the bones? Yeah. Yes. Uh. I, I think what you'll find is is that there are two narratives. There's an underground narrative which the uh, law enforcement and the state are trying to suppress. And then there's the public narrative that the uh, MTSO are trying to push through Kratz, et cetera, et cetera. So in other words, there are two stories going on. Uh, one, what actually did happen, and two, a bullshit covert story, right? Yeah. And so yeah. now, as more documents are coming to light, as more photographs are coming to light, uh, you can see that what the state proposed is pure garbage, 
right? And that, that explains why you have no proper crime scene documentation. The reason why you don't is so that the state can make up any scenario that they want. And what, what, what don't you have? You don't have a coroner, you don't have a forensic anthropologist, and you've got no photographs of, of the critical remains anywhere, right? And you've got Bushman, it's all deep six, undercover suppressed. Therefore, yeah. what the court are trying to do, and, you know, it's devastating when you think about it, the court are trying to shut the door on Kathleen Zellner, preventing her from even opening up her mouth. And yeah. that, that, that's pretty bad. It's devastating, actually, and um, as depressing as it is, but I think that's the whole truth, what you just said, that they're doing everything legal, illegal, and invented uh, legality all of a sudden to suppress her, to just, as you said, shut the door, and because we yes. know the consequences, that yes. all the whole state would fall down. Yes. I agree Normally, with you, never like yeah. yeah. You have to ask the question, sorry, guys, you have to ask the question, why is the state investing so much time, money, energy and effort in a response like this, right, when all they have to do is to say, okay, we're confident with our forensic evidence, you're confident with yours, all right, we'll put it in front of a judge. We're confident that Stephen Avery is going to be found guilty. <laughs> And the reason why is because, is because their forensic evidence and their narrative is so paper thin, uh, Kathleen Zellner is going to punch so many holes through them, um, they know they're in trouble. So uh, well, what they're trying you, to you do, know, yeah. You know, Dr. Suckman, when you just said that, Kyle Hayne's left arm just set on fire wherever she's at. Correct. She just went up Correct. smoke. You know. The Correct. state are no longer up against Butin and Strang. Mm. They are up, they're up against a completely different animal altogether, and they haven't got a lion's hammer. That's Correct. why they won't let them into court. They're, <laughs> yeah. they're so afraid. They're, you know, they're so scared of Kathleen Zellner that they're trying to shut her down before she's completely. even opened her mouth. Correct. You've got it Correct. absolutely correct, Dr. Silkman. You're spot Correct. on, man. Correct. Okay. The, they... They're trying to legally block her from even opening up her book. Legally, illegally. <laughs> Correct. Correct. I know Correct. You, haven't, you haven't really had a chance to speak on it, Dr. Suckman, but what do you think about a lot of this beginning part where Susan started was about the CD, the belly CD, that is? Do you have any well, thoughts there? Yes. It, no, it, guys, it's exactly the same thing that we see over and over again. Um, they try and trivialize anything that's harmful for them. So all of a sudden, who cares about deeply disturbing pornographic images? Uh, who cares about searches that depict exactly what happened to Teresa Hallbach? All of a sudden, it is trivial. But I think someone made the comment, had Stephen Avery had that material on his computer, it would have made front page news of every yes. newspaper. They would have been burning down the salvage yard and Stephen Avery at the same time. But incidentally, because, yes, sorry. Incidentally, I do believe that there would have been public interest in um, publishing details of the pornographic or of the pornographic content, because regardless of whether Bobby was the killer of Teresa or not. There was, that was a crime in itself it and should have been investigated as such. Well, they didn't want to publicise it because they knew that by publicising it, they would have to have taken a further, um, a, a, deep, a, a much stronger hand with regards Correct. to would that. would have had to deviate from Stephen. <laughs> Correct. Correct. Well, that's absolutely right, yes. Yeah. Correct. They, Correct. they, they were absolutely hell-bent on neutralising any alternative yes correct correct uh and we see that now uh we 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 see that now with item fl the bullet fragment uh during the trial it was huge you know it was portrayed as the bullet that killed Teresa hallbach although 
the state never said it, but implied it. Game when Palinic came, yeah, when Palinic came along, oh, we don't care about item FL now. And that's exactly what they're doing uh, with the CD. They don't care. They're saying, oh, yeah, look, we gave it to Strang and Buting. It's not our fault that they didn't analyze it, right? So they're diffusing it, deflecting. They're pointing away from anything that looks bad for the state. That was something else that they said in the uh, in the reply uh, brief is that Beauty and Strain talked to Kratz about the CD. I don't remember that at all. I remember them talking to about Bailey, you know, but not about. Well, I need to. I don't remember them talking about the I'm CD. On, <clears throat> I think that must have been part of the gentleman's agreement that's been kind of hushed up. And you know, you got to understand. You got to ask yourself, well, why would Putin and Strang have agreed to that? Yeah, well, it depends well, on what Kratz told them. <laughs> well, we we, we, right, we, we know hmm. we, but we know that the lawyers, and according to Putin, they already knew what the DOJ were like. They knew what the state were like as far as their prosecution teams were concerned. So why all of a sudden would he start trusting their word now? No, that's right. What was that, Big Joe? Do you know what I mean? It's like yeah. you can't you can't turn around on Man One during the trial and say, "Oh well, you know, I can understand that they might have broken the law to convict the guilty man." You can't say that thinking that the DOJ and Ellie were capable of that kind of thing. And then turn around prior to trial and say, oh, okay, I'll take your word on that and I'll believe what you're saying. Yeah, that's fine. That's good enough. You're, you know, I, I trust you on that. You can't, you know, you've got a foot in both camps again. How can that possibly be the case? The whole yes. reply was like that, hypocritical like that. They even threw their own um, forensic DNA analyst, Colheen, under the bus when they said, well, she never even establish where did that dna come from to me that was a mistake that they did because um she will be well, destroyed if given a chance that's, there's the ghost of jean couchet where did that dna come from yes um, yeah. but, well, hmm. i was gonna say the other thing that i got out uh, from the reading this morning is that they've now trivialized the uh, bones, the cremains at the Manitowoc County gravel pit. And it just blew my mind uh, that um, now the state actually don't care about the cremains, who they actually belong to, um, because they're trying to diffuse uh, the impact of uh, identifying whose cremains they actually are. In fact, I'm going to do a presentation on just that. Um, like They're trying to, yes. I'm oh, sorry. I, I agree with you. They are trying to. Um, re, they're trying to disregard the bones as though the bones are, or, or the remains are of no no significance oh, whatsoever. Yes, yeah. Correct. At the end of the day, you've got to accept that it's the bones, bone evidence. And and the, and all right, and the and the blood DNA and all the rest of it. That's mainly what convicted Stephen. I yes. don't care, you know, if it wasn't for that bone kind of farce, there would have been no case. Yes, yes, uh, but it's amazing, and uh, you guys have hit the nail on the head. During the trial, um, anything that's harmful to them, they don't want to talk about. Uh, Ken Kratz distinctively said he doesn't want to talk about the bones in the Manitowoc County gravel pit. But he, as far as he's concerned, they're non-evidence. And now the state in their response to Kathleen Zellner saying, oh, who cares? Who cares whose cremains they belong to? If they belong to Teresa Horbach, no problems. Uh, it's because Stephen put them there or his uh, accomplice, Brendan Dassey. So, in other words, they are changing their narrative on the fly. So, if something is potentially harmful to them, they keep on blaming Stephen and Brendan for everything. And you know what's amazing? I bet you what, what will happen is 
we'll discover what happened that cuss road, right? It'll come out. It eventually will come out. How are the state going to handle that? They'll blame Brendan and Stephen for it. So they're pointing the finger at only one person or two people all the time, no matter what they find. Well, he only kind of, he already kind of tried to do that a little bit anyway. Mm -hmm. how do I, he said, Correct. Uh, how, how do we know that Brendan and, or uh, that, that uh, Avery and his, you know, his uh, co co accomplice. Yeah. Didn't co conspirator. Uh, yeah. yeah. Take this, take these bones over there. How do we know? Cur Correct, correct. But you see, what they're doing is speculating, right? And so it now, but you see, by doing that, it now opens them up to ridicule, right? So if Stephen Avery, think about it, right? If Stephen Avery put some of Teresa Horbuck's cremains in the Manitowoc County gravel pit, why did he do it in three separate piles? And why did he leave any incriminating uh, bones in his own backyard? Right. right. If you're going, if you're going to move the cremains, you take them all. You don't just take a few, put some in your sister's burn barrel, and then decide to go to the uh, gravel pit and and place some in three separate piles. It's a joke. Jeff, did you have some uh, thoughts? Uh, yeah, my thought, my thoughts were actually back at the CD, uh, and um, you know, we we know we know that there was a conversation because we know that Kratz had the opportunity to tell Beauty and Strang that they didn't find much of evidentiary value on the uh, on on the CD, um, and it was actually a, a brilliant move because. Uh, you know, if they had found, if, if they had told Kratz what they found on the CD, uh, or sorry, if Kratz had told them what, what they found on the CD, uh, you, you'd, you'd have every expectation that uh, if it was uh, inculpatory against Brendan, that they would use it at trial. So if you say, well, we didn't find anything that we're going to use against trial at Brendan, which, which, they, did, which they did not, then, you know, th th then you can, you can see the sort of the ruse, the ruse that they played. Right? And the ruse that they played was, oh, yeah, that, that information pointed to somebody else, just not Brendan. Correct. So uh, it, was, it was a very, very devious move, and, and it, was a, it, was a bit, it was a big fat lie. But there, there had to be a conversation between them about it in order for Kratz to be able to say that. And that was the question I think that you asked, Jack. So you didn't remember there being a conversation? Well, there had to be yeah, a conversation if I that mean, was. Yeah, the, the stipulation project, I, I do recall that. Um, I can't remember all the precise wording that was in, you know, what Kratz had proposed and, and all that. I do remember that, though. Thank you. And, and the other thing with, with regard to the bones um, was, isn't, isn't there a correlation uh, between the time of the return of the bones to the hall box and the denial of a motion that Hagopian had put forward? Uh, and, and, and basically that was... Uh, you know, Stephen's last um, motion that he was able to put forward with a lawyer because he was out of appeals. Uh, yes. And this other yes. one. That, yes. Uh, so yes. The I think that the timing of the bones has to do, um, you know, more with that. that, that it tells you that they were, they were nervous about these bones. They were tracking yes. what was going on with the bones very closely. And the yes. second they became, a not, you know, sort of what they felt was a non-option not they got rid of them as fast as they, they could. They got rid of them Bam. immediately. They immediately they, got rid of them. These things have to go now that he's out of appeals. Had yeah, Kathleen that... Zeller not entered the picture, nobody would ever ever be even thinking about it or or, uh, or making a murder for that matter, right? Correct. So they, Correct. They, they, were, they were watching them close. They needed to go, right? It yes. It wasn't the hallbacks that I don't, – don't, don't fall for this. It was the hallbacks uh, that asked for him back. Uh, it, was, no. it was the state. We need to get rid of these things. Uh, here's the point we're never going to see him again. He's out of appeals. No, no pro se feel. No pro se thing is going forward. We don't have to worry about that. Um, let's get rid of him now. And the last of the evidence is. Been... And I think Dr. Silfen, as you said many times, the Rav is gone. Ski. The Rav is gone. Uh, Rav is gone. Yeah, gone. Yeah, yeah, Rav is gone. Yeah. yeah they, they, they. Uh, I think there's a statute in Wisconsin that that just allows you to keep the um, sort of the pieces. In other words, the, uh, the when you, when you look, the the the, the pretile even, even even perhaps even something smaller than that, they might even just have yes. done some cutouts 
of the, uh, of the panels. The same, the same right. as uh, Colhane did for the, the, the blood, the seat. Uh, yes, on, on the stain, seat, right? Correct. So they might just have like in a small file cabinet, right? <laughs> Little spots. Yes. Of that, that, that thing is long gone. Yeah, and uh, they'll, they'll, argue is, they'll argue that they kept the swabs and that's all they needed to keep. Yeah, we'll it's never gone. see hiding the, the hair Rav. of A23. No, the Rav is gone. I reckon yeah. A23 is gone as well. They'll get rid of biological evidence that is supposed to be maintained until um, their Stephen, A Stephen, Stephen Avery's death or release. If they'll get rid of that, they they have no reason to hang on to the Rav at all, or any no. parts of it as far as I'm concerned. No. The rev was a liability. The longer they held on to the rev, they were in danger. So it was imperative that the rev had to go. Yes. the The rev four would have given um, would have given a map of what actually happened to it. Uh, they couldn't yes. risk it, and that's why the light, the blinker light. If you have a look at the original photographs, oh, they yeah. cleaned it. That light has been cleaned. It has. So whatever was on it, whatever residue was on it, they wiped it off. At what point is any of this going to be considered as evidence tampering? And who is going to drop the hammer on them for it? How are they going to be accountable, held accountable for this? I need to know. We need Thor and his hammer to come and knock some sense into the bastards. <laughs> Sorry about the language. I know you're recording. It's okay. I, We're yeah. good. Yeah, we'll be okay. I think, I think it has to go. I know you're going to laugh at me. It has to go to an international court. It has to go out of the U.S. That's how bad it is. Well, I've I've considered writing to the I've considered writing to the United Nations because yes. I believe that Brendan's human rights were violated. I believe that he is a political prisoner and that um, I have actually expressed um, a, a, a concern and I have given the idea across that I would like to see Scotland Yard investigating this. Yes. Oh, me too. Oh, They yeah. are the best in the world. They, yes. you, you know, you are not going to pull one over these guys. Nope. And all it would take would be for somebody to ask. Yeah. It would take somebody within the Wisconsin DOJ to stand up and say, Do you know what? I'm fed up with all this bull crap. I'm going to write to, I'm going to write to the British Home Secretary and I'm going to ask for his assistance. It, know. You know, it's not, it's not unknown. They are, the, the British police are only, only too willing to assist where they can. Yeah, I know he's retired, but I would certainly like to see, have seen Stephen Moore take a really close look. Yeah, at him. he's another yeah. one retired FBI. Yes, I'd like yeah. to see Doctor Lee have a look at it, the forensic guy. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, uh, yeah, I know who you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, uh, it needs to go outside the U.S. Yeah, it's not going to, it's not going to, because all it's going to get done in the meantime is it's going to be swept under every carpet. Anytime someone has a look at this, it's going to be swept under the carpet. When yeah. somebody who doesn't have a vested interest in the case comes along, then you might get a reasonable investigation. But until then, that is simply not going to happen. Yeah, correct. And as time goes by, more evidence is being lost. Yeah, yeah. Or discarded. Yeah, correct. Correct. Well, does anybody have anything else that they want to add? Uh, well, the only thing I want to highlight is that I think the state are really, really worried. Uh, they fired their best shot at Kathleen Zellner. They're all guns blazing. Absolutely everything that she put forward they tried to destroy so you know the question is why are they doing that uh, are they concerned that their uh, case 
against Stephen is so flimsy that they're in massive, massive trouble. Uh, and I think they fired their best shot. If Kathleen Zona can uh, convince the judge, kudos to her because uh, it's going to take a miracle. It's got really going to take a miracle. I agree. Yeah. Bye. I, I agree with you, Dr. Sutton, but <clears throat> you can't ignore what she does have. She's got a lot of um, she's got a lot of merit in what she's presented. With has been about, it, about the has been it, Jackie. Well, I, I, you sorry, know, Jack. I, I, I don't mean about him. I'm more the optimist, I guess. I could be wrong. You know, I've been wrong before, but uh, I think yes, having it, having it is one thing. Being able to use it is a different matter. Well, if they'll um, let her, if they'll let her know, use it. Correct. Right, but they've 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 tried to prevent her from getting hold of it for the last five years. They haven't managed to do that, so all their efforts now are going to be to prevent her from using it. Sure. Which is they, what they don't want to. Yeah, they don't want it to come to the dance at all. Exactly. Uh, that, that's a very me, good way of putting it too. <laughs> yeah, to me, to me, to me, that's um, uh, the ultimate form of desperation. Uh, they know that she's uh, a brilliant attorney. Uh, she's got the very best of the best, uh, and uh, they're going to prevent her from even putting her hand on the doorknob to get in. That's yeah. what they're trying to do in a legal perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this but is no, typical I think of bullying. Moving goalposts as you go along, yeah. you can't yeah. win. You just can't win. Somebody no, has no, to legally punch them in the mouth. Yeah, but now it's time for Kathleen to take the gloves off. Correct. Yep. This is her That's last what chance. I think. This is her last chance. Yeah. And I think personally, she needs to prioritize exactly how she's going to take apart the state's case. This, the, there are some things which are more important than others. Um, so she really has to go in there with the laser focus uh, to convince a judge. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Well, on, on the other excited. hand, she, 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 can, she can only talk about the things that, that they said. So she can try and pick apart their argument. Um, yes. She doesn't really have the opportunity to introduce sort of new stuff or new arguments no. in, in this uh, particular uh, you know, uh, response. No. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, for me, for me personally, I think the two areas that she should put her focus on uh, are the bullet, Ida Mephel, try and discredit uh, Sheree Cohane. Uh, and by discredit, discrediting Cohane, uh, she basically effectively removes Teresa Horbuck from the garage. That's huge because that actually backs up the forensic evidence. Uh, and I reckon the other point of attack uh, are the bones. The, um, the bones found at the Manitowoc County gravel pit. I agree. And she should focus on the pelvic bone. Now, I'm going to do, do a presentation uh, on Dr. Symes, because Dr. Symes has got it perfect. He attacked Eisenberg professionally. And I'll tell you what, Eisenberg is in deep, deep trouble. So you're saying that I'm she, so should glad. Get, she should get a set of shackles just like uh, Miss Sherry? Cohen. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think with, um, I think with uh, Eisenberg, she was scared scared of her mind because the trouble is as you'll see she was working on the christine rudy case and she made a big big blunder yeah, right she and yeah. she was working on the christine rudy case at the same time yes. she was working on the Teresa horbach wow. case right. and if you look at the christine rudy case i swear to god it's a all you need to do is change the name of the case take away christine rudy put Teresa horbach and you've got the identical set of circumstances, exactly the same, same analysis, same everything, right? And um, Eisenberg was the forensic pathologist, anthropologist in both cases. Yep. She made a huge mistake uh, with the fetal bones. 
she said they were she said they were human fetal bones. Well, they turned out to be animal. But here's the trouble: she didn't do the testing uh, to determine whether they were animal or human. They were sent to a laboratory, right? And the laboratory was the one that did the analysis. Now wait for it on charred, burnt bones. Guess what Eisenberg failed to do in the Teresa Horbach case? Identify whether they were animal or human. human. Right. And it could have easily been done with the current technology. And she gave this unbelievable bullshit excuse in court why she never did it. She's in huge trouble. Good. I think the other case was like a like a copy paste or like a cut and paste from between the two Correct. cases oh when god. I read. So Correct. many similarities. Correct. Oh my god. It's um, it's scary. It you, you could almost you, you could almost say it was the same murderer who did both cases who did both murders. It's a pattern match. Well, how about you could say those bones were used to convict two people of something that. Justice didn't happen. <laughs> well, well, that's it. That's why you don't want. That's why you don't want to DNA test the bones. Those that that's a fact, my dear. That absolutely could have taken place. Absolutely. Well, well <laughs> put it this way: uh, Bushman's family had access to a crematorium. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Right. The well, then that's all. The fifth all funeral home or something. That, like that's that. it. That's I, it. That's all you need. That's all you need. And uh, as you said, Jack, uh, those finding of the cremains uh, in the gravel pit—that's a dumping. That's someone's dumping ground for bodies. Oh. Yeah. It seems and like so. It. Yeah, and so when you think about it, one of the dogs, I think, um, hit on a mound pile, right, and the bucket, I think, of um, uh, some heavy equipment. If you think about it, you put bones in there, all those rocks get crushed, right, To they form gravel and they form bitumen, they form all sorts of stuff. You'll never find the body, right? Perfect place to put them, right? Right yeah. next to rock piles, you're never going to find the yeah. victims. Uh, and an so they an aggregate crushing machine. Correct. And correct. You, you would find one of those on a quarry. Correct. Correct. And if you look at the bones, they're all the size of small rocks. Yeah. Yep, that's <laughs> or, right. right. They and, they are about the same size as remains that may have been for a cremulator. Correct. They and are so, almost identical to the stuff yes. that you would expect from a from a, as the remains of a cremation. Correct. I did in, a side in a by crematorium. Side yes. Correct. I did a side yeah. by side comparison. If you took away the labels and say, okay, which one came from a burn pit, which came from a crematorium, you couldn't guess, right? right. Yes. Yeah, sure. Because they're identical. Oh, yeah. I've been to enough cremations to know that. Yes. Yes. Correct. So, um, yeah, it's a pity because uh, with the new testing now, they would have been able to get some DNA from the, the cremains. No question. Absolutely. Well, if there's not anything else, I'm going to probably just this down. I um, want to awesome. thank every single person here for their contributions. Um, I value your opinions and your insight and is so appreciated. And thank you very much for being a part of this today. Big shout out to um, uh, Susan back. for the reading. Thank you all for, yes. thank you all for yes. making me welcome. I've enjoyed it. I always enjoy it. And I'm glad to be part of the community. And thank you, Wizard. Your your insights were fantastic. Fantastic. Well, I wouldn't go so far as to say that, Doc. Together, everyone thank achieves you. more. Thank you very much. Yes. Well done, everybody. Thank you very much. It's been a great evening. So with that, I'm going to say, don't count the days. Make the days count. Days count. Have a good this one, This has guys. been a Foul Play production.